The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. I'm so thrilled to be able to be here with you. We're gonna be with you here live for the next three hours. Yep, seems like a long time, but it goes by really fast. <laughs> we're gonna be talking about topics having to do with autism and how we can be more effective and efficient working with our children on the autism spectrum. Whether you're a parent, a teacher, a practitioner, we know that it's really important to you to be the best possible team member. We know that you've got a child somewhere in your life that you're concerned about and that you see that potential in them and you want to help to bring that out. And I'm thrilled to be able to be here with you to be a conduit to all the good information that's out there that helps us to find that potential in our children and make it grow. We, in particular, one of the big topics that we talk about here is ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. And it's not the only thing that we talk about, but I feel like it's the core of of what we talk about because it's the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. So I like to remind you that what we're talking about A works and that it works for all of our children. Now the degree to which it works, we're all going to have different outcomes. Our children are all different. They all come to ABA at a different age, at a different ability. Uh, so their outcomes are all going to be different. But we know from science, we know that time and time again, science has demonstrated that that all of our children can make progress wherever they are on the spectrum, and that is a wonderful thing. And as we're running around trying to figure out what to do to help our children, I think it's really important for us to focus on things that get results, right? Um, and and. That is the core of what we're talking about here. What's possible, what we can do to see results, how we can see results, how we can map the results so it can help us to get even better results. And I, I'm thrilled to be able to be here and talking with you about it because I'm a parent. I have a son who was diagnosed with autism at two and a half. He's now eight and a half, closer to nine actually now. He'll be nine this summer. And I am so grateful that we got ABA relatively early. He was a, three years old in two weeks when we started ABA. He did five years of intensive ABA therapy here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders and we got our child back. He is in completely included third grade. He is excelling in his classes. He's at or above grade level. Um, he's a wonderful very interesting little soul that speaks and talks and has conversations. Uh, I I like to be very honest about the fact that there are there are children who get to the point where they're virtually in, indistinguishable between neuro, neurotypical peers. Right? Some people call that recovered. Other people get offended by that word. I don't know why, but you know whatever. Um, but there are kids who uh, science has shown that become virtually indistinguishable from their peers. That's not my son yet. Uh, we're still working in that direction. He's getting there and sometimes he's really close and there are some times where he can go quite a long time before somebody says what's what's up there? You know, there's something else going on there. Um, but it takes a while and at the end of the day we get to have conversations. He has friends. He's going to go to college. There's no doubt about that. He's already picking out which colleges he's going to go to. He plans on being a rocket engineer. He's picked out his office at NASA. Uh, Life is good. Life is really good. And we have very little challenging behavior. So I offer that to you as a possibility. And I also want you to know, you know how when they show those commercials for weight loss and they show the person and says, I, you know, I lost 250 pounds in three weeks. I'm exaggerating. And But then on the bottom of the screen, it says results not typical. I want you 
to know that there are those kids in uh, in the world who get to that point of recovery where they're virtually indistinguishable from their peers, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, given the right amount of therapy over the right amount of time, about 47% of kids will get to that point, which is a pretty high percentage. Um, and my son is not in that percentage, and yet his life is full and remarkable and he's a joy and a treat and I can take him anywhere and I don't live in fear of challenging behavior and we have deep and meaningful conversations where he tells me what he's thinking and we talk about what other people are thinking. So I want you to know that, that that's a place that you can get to and you can get beyond that in some cases. So it's a sweet thing. But I am not an expert in autism. I am not an expert in ABA. I am not a BCBA, which is a board certified behavior analyst. I am none of those things. I'm a mom and a former teacher, and I'm really passionate about this subject. But I'm hosting the show because I want to be a conduit for you. If you have things that you want to know, I want to be the one to go and find them out for you. So please be a part of the conversation. Tell me what would help you. That's really what I want to know. Uh, you know, we can talk about everything under the sun, but I want to know what do you need? And you might be sitting there going, well, you know, the thing that I need, you can't give me. No, probably not, but I might know somebody who can, or I might know somebody who has done it before, or somebody who has an idea of how to get it, or somebody who has an idea of who to ask. Uh, it can't hurt, right? The worst thing that could happen is you could ask me and I could say, that's not in place yet. And that's going to be the case sometimes. But at least we're having a conversation about it. And I do think that when we converse about it and say, here's what we need, things start to happen. We've seen a lot of change over the last five years. Not enough, but a lot of change. So be a part of the conversation. How do you be a part of the conversation? There are lots of different ways. Today in particular, we're having some technical difficulties. So your ability to ask me a question uh, on the forum you see before you is down for the moment. Um, but you can be emailing us right now. And we're watching the email. So it can be you know like a second delay kind of thing. But send your questions that way. You can also be phoning. We have a phone number here at the studio you can be calling in. You can even be patched into me directly so we can have a conversation right here in front of everybody. Or you can be talking to somebody outside the studio if you prefer. But we're standing by taking your phone calls. Also, you can Skype in. We're live right now. If you want to Skype in and you have picture, you can do it just sound if you want to. But if you want to do picture, we can. We have the capability. Uh, so you could be right here with me having a conversation in that way. You can also be talking to us on Facebook. and. Uh, uh, that's a wonderful way for you to participate because everybody else gets to see it as well. And of course, there's always Twitter. You can be talking to us on Twitter. I'm getting better at the tweeting thing. I'm not there yet. I'm not proficient, but I'm working my way up. Baby steps, right? Uh, there are lots of different ways to watch the show. If you're watching us on Autism Hyphen Live, that's wonderful. But you can also be watching us on Blip TV. I gotta say, I love this because it's a way for you to rewind, fast forward, say, I want to watch Wednesday's episode because I know Nancy Allspot Jackson's going to be on a Wednesday and she is something else. So you can pick and choose what you want to see on Blip TV. You can also be watching us on YouTube if your time is limited like so many of you and I totally get that as a parent. Uh, you're thinking I just need to know about the toilet training. When they talked about the toilet training that's the part I got to watch. You'll see really um, specific clips on YouTube so that you can search a topic and say this is what I want to see. Uh, you can also be downloading us on iTunes which is a wonderful wonderful thing. And so Soon, very soon, you will be able to download just the audio portion on iTunes because I know many of you have asked and said, I want to be able to listen to this in the car or while I'm walking. And I make a lot of faces. It's really distracting. So it might be better to uh, listen, just listen. Uh, okay, so lots of different ways to get a hold of us, lots of different ways to watch, be a part of the conversation. Remember that even over the weekend or when we're not here uh, at night, there you can still be putting in your requests. If you email us, we'll answer your question as soon as we can on the air, but we'll also send you a typewritten response. So it's 
it's our way of being in communication with you but if you have other ways that you would like to be in communication let us know also want to let you know that on this lovely Tuesday morning if you are in the Los Angeles area we're having a blood drive today here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders and they're changing lives saving lives with blood donation if you're in the Los Angeles area you can drop by I believe it's until 2 o'clock this afternoon drop in give some blood they'll give you a cookie and you can stop in and say hello to us. That would be wonderful. We're located at 19019, that's right, isn't it? Uh, Ventura Boulevard in Tarzana, California. All right, so if you're in the Los Angeles area and want to do something, we were talking yesterday about how we can't do everything, right? Um, but if we think about what can I do today, and if you have some free time today and you're at all in the area, give some blood. You'll help someone else, and it's good karma, right? We like to start every morning with something that we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. Uh, this is where we take one word, one phrase, one anagram, one crazy making jargon term and demystify it. We know that as we're going through this journey with our child, the journey through autism, we are going to meet a lot of jargon, a lot of jargon, a lot of jargon jargon on the way. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. Um, and it can be overwhelming. It can absolutely be the thing that sends you over the edge because you're you're overtired, you're underslept, overstressed, right? Trying to find the answers, wanting to meet with experts, sometimes that's expensive, and then they start talking in a way that you can't even understand, right? We've never heard these terms before, not in the context in which they're speaking them. So we got to do the same thing that we do with our kids. Instead of making it overwhelming in this huge task, we take it down into a little bitty increment and spoon feed just a little bit at a time and try to make it a little reinforcing because I like to make fun of the terms. <laughs> Sometimes the def definitions, excuse me, are worse uh, than the actual term. Okay, so our word today is probe. Yes, that can mean a whole lot of things, right? Uh, you, we send probes into space right and probes that you know they do things to, uh, into your body that are not necessarily nice uh, but for ABA we're talking a little bit different so our actual definition is a test or assessment trial that allows the determination of which skills a person already has and which he or she does not okay not the worst definition but let's take it down uh, a step further our working definition is testing your child out to see whether he or she already knows something or not so the thing about probes and I got a little confused about this the last time we went over this term is that we want to be really careful when we probe to usually if somebody gets something right we want to reinforce 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 right and we want to do big reinforcing the exception to that is going to be with probes so let's say for instance that you are about to start teaching the alphabet to your child and you and you're teaching you want them to be able to look at the letter and recognize the letter um, so you have a set of cards that have a b c d e f g the whole thing on the cards and you're going to do a probe to see which letters your child might already know now you might think to yourself my child absolutely doesn't know any of the letters uh, and that might be true but sometimes our kids surprise us so when in doubt you probe so you take the cards and you flash them one at a time and you hold it up and go what is it and you wait like three seconds and the child is as long as the child has even glanced at it out of the corner of their eye you're giving them three seconds if they don't answer you just put it down you don't say it's an a this is not a teaching moment right you just, oh they don't know it okay what's this and you know you might be going through and waiting three seconds and the child is not responding at all you're not hurting anything you're probing because you might get to Z and the child looks over and says Z oh my goodness then we know a little bit more about what they know um, but we're not if they say it once Z um, it may be that they know it but we're not a hundred percent sure okay so you're gonna probe them at least twice uh, there's a whole protocol for therapists for probing things, um, but for us as parents, we're going to probe them at least twice. And if somebody, let's say you hold up B and you say, what is it? And the child says B, you can say, good, but you're not going to reinforce in a big, huge, heavy way because just on the off chance that they got it 
and they don't really understand it, uh, we don't want to make this a teaching moment, okay? And I had said before, if they get it right, go ahead and reinforce, but I was wrong, and frequently I am wrong. <laughs> So, but it was pointed out to me by a BCBA that, no, we don't really, you know, we don't want to have a non-reaction if they get it right, but just small reinforcement. Good job. That is a B, you know, um, and then go through again. And we probe um, as a very specific thing. Again, when we're probing, we're not teaching. That's hard for me because I come from this background where everything is a teaching moment and why not make everything a teaching moment? But we don't want to muddy the waters here. So when we probe, we're just testing to see what do they know, what do they not know. Uh, one of the, the When I was teaching, uh, one of the things that we were taught was before we were going to teach something to give a test, give a multiple choice test and, uh, of whatever it was that we were about to teach and see what the kids knew. And I remember thinking, that's crazy. Like, well, that's a waste of time. Um, but it was really really great because it reminds you of what you're actually teaching, shows you exactly what the kids know so that you know how to tailor the lesson. And then at the end, we were able to compare, well, here's where we were and here's where we got. We made progress, right? Uh, so if they got none right on the first test and they got 80% of them right, well, that's true progress. Um, and it makes it very clear and defined. So we probe to see what the kids know, what they don't know. And we want to make sure that we do it more than once and we want to make sure that we don't turn it into a teaching moment. You're going to see um, when we show the A word in, in about 45 minutes, you'll see that they do some probing to see what Jack Riley knows in terms of personal ID questions, and he does quite well. Um, and so when the child does something, and I'm sure that that therapist went back and did it again to make sure that he knew and could do it in different circumstances. Um, but when you see that a child already knows something, then you know, well, I guess we don't have to teach that because they already know it. So imagine, you know, you got the whole alphabet and you're thinking, I gotta teach the whole alphabet, but you go through and you see that the child knows L and P. Well, that's fabulous. Then we don't have to teach L and P and we're gonna focus on the rest of them. Why waste time? Let's be efficient and effective, right? Okay, so that's probing. Um, all right. And uh, we always have a question of the day for you. So let's take a look at the question of the day, which is meant to get you interacting and participating. A lot of you are answering the question of the day on Facebook. I love that because you talk to each other and support each other. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Okay, so our question of the day is, what would you like to do that you haven't been able to since your child was diagnosed? And it can be something as simple as, you know, you haven't been able to take a weekend and go away with your significant other um, or it could be you know as simple as you'd like to go to the grocery store and spend however much money you want and not be on a budget um, it could be that you want to have a good night's sleep you know I'm interested to know what it is that you would like to do that you haven't been able to do since your child was diagnosed. Now this has changed for me so much over the years. In the first couple of years that my child was diagnosed, there were so many things that I had not had the opportunity to do. I gotta be honest with you, I, I can't think of a single thing right now. There've been so many things that we weren't able to do for a period of time, and now we, we that's just not the case. We're able to do uh, pretty much anything that we want to do. Um, so that's pretty amazing. I'm sure that there's some financial things that we still can't do as I think about it. So maybe that's it. Uh, yeah. Um, but you know what? That's okay. I'll trade that any day of the week for where we are right now. But I'd love to hear from you guys. Where, where are you? What would you like to do? I've said a lot on this show that we have not figured out the babysitting thing. I just, I'm hopeless. Uh, we're working on it and I have better minds than me working on it too, because I heard from you guys, uh, overwhelmingly that you have troubles finding babysitters as well too. And I think we all need to go on, on more dates, uh, with our spouses and significant others. And for those of you guys who are going this alone as single parents, heaven knows you need to have opportunities to get out and, and have a date or just have time to yourself. I, man, I have nothing but heartfelt respect if you're doing this alone because I I just don't know I I don't know how we managed to get through it as a family and we were all together and I had a wonderful person who helped to shoulder everything that happened so 
Wow. You guys that do it by yourself, really amazing to me. Quite inspirational. Okay, we also always have a topic of the day. And if you haven't guessed, our topic for this entire week is challenging behavior. I really want to talk about challenging behavior in a really in-depth way. Uh, It keeps cycling back up in my life that as I talk to parents, and I wrote a blog about this not too long ago on our sister site, The Bridge, if you want to take a look at it, uh, about the fact that I'm, I'm seeing now that there's two categories of parents and there's parents who know and parents who don't know and that's really how I'm starting to think of it and please know that there's no judgment there's no judgment whatsoever because whatsoever because there are some things in life that like you there's information and you either get it or you don't and um, and I can think of so many other circumstances. I remember years and years ago working with a woman who um, her child suddenly took ill. She was a freshman in college and she took very ill, got really um, quite gravely ill. And the mom was saying, I have to get there. I have to get there as quickly as I can. And she called up the airline and they were quoting her a price for a ticket. And it was thousands of dollars to go like that day. And you know how that is. This was before Priceline and all those other things that you call the airline and they would just quote you a price and it would just be devastating. And she broke down in tears on the phone with the airline and said, you don't understand. My daughter is sick. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have that money and I need to get there. And the woman said, oh, okay, well, um, we can get you on a flight for $350. And the woman said, what do you mean? You just told me it was 2000 whatever dollars. And she goes, oh, yeah, but we have a special rate for... And my friend was saying, how can it be 2000 whatever or $350? And, and the, the ticket person on the phone said, well, you know, because we have different... And it just seemed like it was this crazy thing. And she, I remember her coming in and saying to all of us, did you know that you could negotiate a plane ticket? Or And everybody's saying, well, you know, they have things if somebody's ill that they'll give you a discount. And, and she said, I had no idea. I, If I just had that much money, I just would have paid it. I had no idea that you could have a conversation. And of course now, you know, times have changed with plane tickets and we know it's, you, you didn't go on Priceline, name your own price and see if they'll accept it. And uh, it's a bidding war for, for plane tickets. But there was a time when she did not know that the value of a plane ticket wasn't fixed. And she said, this opens up a whole new world. And her her daughter recovered and was fine. And she came back and she called her car insurance company and they were saying, well, it's this much for the car insurance. And she said, yeah, I don't want to pay that. I'm going to go to somebody else. So you either lower the rate or And they did. They lowered the rate. She said, who knew you could negotiate all these things in your life? And it really opened a door for her because she went from being somebody who didn't know to somebody who did know. So that's my comparison in autism. I think that there are parents who know that challenging behavior can be targeted and made better. And there are parents who think still that challenging behavior, well, it's the autism. There's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing that can be done. This is my lot in life. Nobody understands and it's horrible and it's terrible, but I, I, you know, this is the behavior that my child has and there's nothing to be done about it. Um, and I have to tell you that that keeps me up at night because it is something that can be targeted and there is help for challenging behavior and we know this this is not pie in the sky this is not five years from now this is not 10 years from now this is 10 years ago Uh, this is 15 years ago that we knew that these challenging behaviors could be targeted and changed and fixed and and when they're targeted and changed and fixed It's a relief for the child, and it's a relief for the family, and it's a relief for everyone who is in the circle of that family. So I hope that I can spread the message, and I hope that you guys will spread the message too, because we want to move more parents from the don't know to the do know. Um, and it and it doesn't mean, you know, I'm a firm believer in getting a, 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 an intensive ABA program. I really am. And I have reason to believe in that because it changed my son's life. It changed my life. I've seen it change so many other children's lives. But even if you can't get your head wrapped around that or you can't get your state legislature wrapped around that, you can't get your insurance company wrapped around that, and you certainly can't get your bank account wrapped around that, that I understand. 
But even if that is your case, there are things that you can be doing. I always say Cardi Learning and Skills, it's available for all of us and, and it's a very small price, but I understand small price when you're dealing with autism might still be too much. You can get a grant for it. Um, you know, fill out a grant for ACT today. You can get a grant for Skills and Cardi Learning. So no one should be without, seriously. Um, and if you feel like you're excluded, please challenge me and write me and let's talk because nobody is, is to be left out of that. But also you can target these challenging behaviors and you don't have to have this whole huge 40 hour a week program to target challenging behaviors, change your life. So we're going to talk about that a lot today because I just feel like, you know, we need to get more people in the column that know as opposed to don't know. Okay. So our schedule today, we're going to talk about some motor things. We're going to talk about some healthy eating. We're going to do the myth of the day, but really I kind of rearranged it a little bit last night because I really want to talk about challenging behavior. There's something in particular that um, I I read the other day and I got to see if I can bring it up that I initially I thought it was really cute and funny and then I went oh no this is a parent who doesn't know um, and it really has been uh, on my mind let's say that so we're really we're, we're hijacking the show today and talking about challenging behavior that's what's going on so stick with us take a break because we're going to come back and we're going to talk about biting we're going to start out with biting and go from there but if your child is engaging in a challenge challenging behavior today and you want us to specifically talk about that challenging behavior, uh, email us or call us right now um, because there's the email address because that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Challenging behavior and how do we target and how do we turn this bus around? How do we take that big deep breath and go, wow, that was in the past. My child's not doing it, that anymore. And let me tell you, it's not just a deep breath for you. It's a deep breath for the child as well. So stick with us back in a minute. Here I stand, a man, someone who has overcome struggles, someone who has endured perceptions of what others thought of him, thinking he was stupid because he was autistic, or simply believing him to be nothing because he was different to them in their minds. But I stood my ground. I just wanted to say to the organization in general, Alongside helping me to improve communicatively and socially, the other greatest gifts you gave me were the value of discipline and a good work ethic. To quote Anthony Kiedis, to celebrate you is greater now that I can. You helped me to realize that the harder you work, the likelier you are to achieve success. Having had to work very, very hard to recover from autism, this discipline has continued to serve me well. I also realized that you taught me a lot about and instilled within me a quality of having compassion and sympathy for other people. That you will be concerned more with the needs and wishes of others than with your own is something that I awe and I constantly strive to be. And in closing, the only way I can sum up card all of you is love. Everything you do to help families in need, you do out of the sheer love of wanting to make a positive difference in people's lives. And as I stand here before you as a mature adult, I have to say that I'm extremely grateful for your unwavering loving commitments to helping others and me recover from potential life roadblocks and become active and contributing members of society. While I can't overcome obstacles without a will, I cannot have a will without the love of those supporting me. And without love, I am nothing. Thanks again so very much for your love. Everything that you've done and continue to do, please give my best wishes to your families, everybody else with Cardi was in here, and especially all of your clients and their kids. I'm confident that they too will be able to overcome, and I know that they'll be successful with what they do as long as they continue to put their minds, hearts, passions, and best efforts into it. That's said. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and today we're talking about challenging behavior all day long today. We're hitting it hard. We're starting with biting. Um, for those of you who have children who are biting, um, and I know, and we're going to talk about a lot of different kinds of challenging behavior throughout the day, and I want to remind you that if you have a question about a specific challenging behavior that you want us to talk about, email us right now. Um, and tell us what challenging behavior is really uh, disrupting your day and making it difficult for your child because uh, th that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. We're starting out with biting. For those of you who have children who bite, the biting thing is really, um, I mean, it's all... <laughs> 
devastating, right? But there's something about the biting, and I've, I've known several different parents that there's a little bit of a shame thing involved in it too. That uh, there are a couple of different moms that I can think of that shared that their child was biting them and biting them on their arm and biting them so hard that they had horrible, horrible bruises and were behaving a lot like a, a battered spouse that they would make sure that they always had long sleeves on. I, you know, I always make sure I have long sleeves on because I have ugly arms, not because I have bite marks. But can you imagine, I'm sure some of you can, um, that when your child is biting, it can be so devastating. Um, and I think there's a, there's a weird element to it too because uh, a lot of parents will report that they're having a snuggly moment with their child so that you're in this, oh, loving, 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 and hugging your child, which we all want the opportunity to do, right? And that that's when the bite sometimes will come. Uh, if that's not your incidence with biting, we're going to talk about all the different ways that biting can show up. But I think there's something really emotionally hard about that particular kind of biting. So what can we do? Do we just throw our hands up and say it's autism and there's nothing that can be done? No, we never do that because that's our whole message for today, that challenging behavior can be targeted and changed. But in order for us to change it, we first of all have to understand behavior and secondly, we have to understand the function of this particular behavior with this particular child. And we cannot assume. Assuming will get us in deep, deep doo-doo. That's the technical term. <laughs> I warned you, I'm not a VCBA, uh, but I work with a lot of BCBAs, so it's my technical term, in deep, deep doo-doo. I don't think the BCBAs say that. In any case, uh, so if we're talking about behavior, and on our lovely screen here, Emily has put up for you the ABCs of behavior, and this is where we start with any challenging behavior. We And actually, this is where we start with any behavior at all. For any behavior that's exhibited over and over and over again, we see, well, actually, for any behavior at all, we see that there's an A, a B, and a C. That the A is what happens before. We call that the antecedent. There's some jargon for you. The antecedent is whatever happens directly before. The B is the behavior and the C is the consequence. Think about it. Everything that you and I do, uh, that we do all day, th there's the antecedent what happens, there's the B, the behavior, and the C, the consequence. Uh, you know, I'm feeling thirsty and my throat is a little bit scratchy, so I drink some water. So the A is that I'm thirsty, the B is that I take a drink, and the C is the consequence that I feel better as a result. Um, and when the consequence is in any way reinforcing, we'll do that behavior again, and again, and again, and again. Great. So what we need to do when we're looking at challenging behaviors is figure out what's the antecedent, what's happening directly before that's triggering this behavior, what's the actual behavior, and what is the the consequence that has a payoff here. Because when we know these three things, we have the ability to change something. Really hard to change the behavior, right? We Haven't we all stood there and said to a child or an adult in our lives, stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Like a broken record, right? And how effective is it? Not. It is not effective. It's really hard to control a behavior. Um, but we have a lot of control over what happens before the behavior and we have ultimate control of what happens as a consequence of the behavior. So we're going to be smart instead of foolish, which believe me, I have a hard time with that and I forget on a daily basis, but whenever possible, we're going to look and say, okay, what is the antecedent before this behavior and what is the consequence for this behavior? I want to figure out what the function, what function is this behavior serving? Right? The drinking the water, the function of the behavior, I, you know, it feels good after I drink the water. So of course I'm going to drink more water on a regular basis. Um, all right. So what do you think the the, the uh, payoff is for what's the function of the behavior when your child is biting? And let me tell you that it may be that your child is biting and that on different occasions it has a different function. Ah, right? Uh, this is why we need to start writing down, and it's great to take a piece of paper and make yourself two columns. 
Let's see, I don't have a piece of paper that I can demo it on. Uh, I thought I did, but I don't. So if we take a piece of paper and we have two columns, uh, so two lines, so we've got three columns, and we write A, B, C. We can all remember our A, B, Cs, right? The tough part is remembering that A stands for antecedent, because that's the new word. But we all know behavior and we all know consequences, right? So when you see the child engaging in the biting, you go right to the behavior column because the behavior is happening, right? And you may not be able to do it in the exact moment because in the exact moment you might be moving the dog or the child or your arm or whatever away from the child that, that, that's biting. Um, but the first opportunity that you have to, you're gonna write down what the behavior was. You know, uh, Susie bit the dog and you write down the time, it was a 210 and uh, she bit down hard, because you wanna really talk about what the behavior is. She bit down hard and wouldn't let go and so then you get into consequences. You know, well, I yelled at her and said stop and I pulled her away and made her sit in the corner, if that's what the consequence was, right? Um, and so now you've written down the behavior, and really important to be as specific as possible, write down the time, write down exactly what the behavior looked like. It may just have been that she, you know, put her mouth on the dog and pretended like she was going to bite, but she didn't. On another time, she bit down with her teeth and she held on for five seconds. Be specific. It really is helpful. And But then the, the consequence is, you know, you write down what happened as a result of uh, the, the biting. Now you get to be a detective and go back and try to think in your memory, and this is where it gets dicey, and you may not be perfect, but you're, to the best of your ability, you're gonna write down what happened before, right before. What happened right before she bit the dog? Did the dog walk by her and you were petting the dog? Um, did the dog take her toy? Uh, did uh, somebody turn the TV on or, or say we're leaving? What happened right before? Sometimes you won't remember, don't beat yourself up, it's to the best of your ability. But if you do this for a couple of days even, you will start to see some amazing things. Something is going to jump out at you and you're going to go, huh, I didn't notice that before. Did, uh, you know, and you'll, you'll be sitting there talking to somebody saying, did you realize that, you know, she bites after this happens? Or, you know, she bites an hour after lunch. Or, you know, she only bites on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Or, you know, uh, or, you're, or you'll go, huh, that's interesting. Every time she bites, I yell at her and I give her a timeout and yet the biting is continuing. If the timeout was working for the bite, the bite would get less and less. That's an interesting concept, right? If the, if, if the consequence is actually gonna diminish the behavior, we should see it fairly quickly, right? And if it's not diminishing it, then it's not working. Time to think of something else. Okay, so when we're looking for the function of the behavior, usually there are four main suspects that somebody does something for attention, that's a biggie, right? That somebody does something to escape something that someone does something to gain access to someone or something. And then the fourth one, which is always the toughest one, that it is in some way self-reinforcing, that there's something about it that feels good. That's the toughest one, but it's not impossible to fix. Okay, so you might look at it and say, you know, well, I think that my child is biting for attention. Great. What are you basing that on? And this is where we get into it's really not good to guess. Um, and I, yesterday or the day before, I think it was yesterday, our uh, jargon of the day was FBA, Functional Behavior Assessment. When we do those three columns, it's one of many steps for an FBA. And when it's challenging behavior, and if you really want it to stop quickly, I really want to recommend that you get a BCBA, a Board Certified Behavior Analyst, who has experience with autism and has experience with this specific challenging behavior you're targeting to come in. It is going to cost you a little bit of money. It may cost you, I don't know, depending on where you live in the world, it, uh, but I'll tell you what, it's money well spent because if you're trying to figure this out completely on your own, it's possible that you're going to make it worse and you really don't want to do that with challenging behavior, especially 
especially if there's the possibility for somebody to be injured. Uh, you just really don't want to mess with that. So I really encourage you to, but still do the three columns because you're going to save money by doing that. The, the BCBA is going to interview you and you're going to say, here's the data, here's what we took, and you're going to save time. It's not going to cost you as much for having done that. Um, but eventually the BCBA is going to come back and say, here's the behavior. And let's look at a couple of different examples of here of i have the example of johnny and miguel uh, and our scenario is that johnny is biting miguel in a classroom and so the big question is what's the function of the behavior but we don't know um so we need to do and it, you know it's, it's just not okay to guess we have to follow the clues and we have to figure out and do an fba so uh we do the fba especially if it's in the instance of uh injure, injury behavior so important okay uh, so let's imagine that we've got this scenario Johnny's biting Miguel and they the FBA is done and they look at the behavior that a the B and the C interview everybody and watch the behavior and the BCBA comes back and this is what they've discovered as they were being a detective that Johnny's biting other children and toys on a regular basis that you know it's happening all day long he's biting children, he's biting toys, he's biting his shirt, he's, you know, biting his thumb, he's chewing on pencils, he's chewing on stuff, right? Uh, his mother reports that he started, this, this started happening after he started taking uh, methyl B12 shots. Um, and there's also been a recent spike in Johnny's uh, speech, that he's speaking more and it's clearer. So in this case, what is the function of the behavior? Of those four suspects, the four most likely suspects that I told you? Well, in this case, what we see is that this is self-reinforcing behavior. And we've got a couple of clues there that tell us why. He's biting everything. So it's not biting a specific thing at a specific time or a specific person. He's biting everything. Even when he's alone by himself, he's biting something. Um, and the, our, our supposition is that it feels good to him, uh, that his mouth is itching, and that when he bites, it feels better. And we we kind of get this from the idea we know that this is a symptom sometimes with a, a methyl B12 shot that children will get the, it's like it something's happening in the mouth it gets tingly for them and they want to bite something it feels uncomfortable so they bite something and that feels better we know that in this particular instance since the um, the shots just started and there was an increase in speech it's likely Whenever you have blood flow go into different parts of the body, it can be itchy. It's a different sensation for kids and it can be uncomfortable. So we need to come up with a behavior intervention plan for this instant. We know that this side effect, if that is in fact what it is, is not gonna last for a long time. So we gotta give this child another way to be able to bite something acceptably so that they're not creating havoc but taking care of this need to bite something. So in this particular instance, we're going to give some sort of a bitey toy to Johnny. Um, it may, they have, you know, bitey chew sticks that can go on pencils. Uh, this actually ended up happening with, with my son and we got him this awesome necklace that looks kind of like a yin and yang necklace and it's got all, it's all safe materials, non-toxic, and even the ribbon that it's on is safe, non-toxic. And he wore it, and everybody in his class thought it was cool. Like, we have college students that have these. But he could, in the afternoon, after lunch, he, you know, he'd just get this itchy, itchy, so he would bite on that. And we were able to fade it out over time, and he didn't have to have the necklace for very long at all. And, and then the chewing stopped. So we need to give a replacement. If it's self-reinforcing and we're doing it because it feels good, we want to give the child something appropriate to bite on, right? It makes a certain amount of sense. I always say there's a duh factor. Uh, well, duh, of course, the child needs to bite something. We just don't want it to be mom or the dog or dad or the kid next to them at school, right? Um, so we give them something appropriate to bite on. We reinforce them when they're biting on the thing that's appropriate, and we can fade that thing out over time. Um, okay.
But imagine that it was an entirely different still. We have Johnny Bitey Miguel, but we did the FBA this time and came back with different results, right? We're just saying as, as if this were four different scenarios. So John, John, in this instance, Johnny only bites Miguel. This child is only biting one other child and only when Miguel is playing with a playground ball. So they did the three columns and saw that every day it's happening during recess only with Miguel and only when Miguel is playing with a playground ball. So we look at the consequences of the behavior and every time Johnny bites Miguel, Miguel gets upset, of course, that's an appropriate response, cries, drops the ball and runs to the teacher to tattle and tell the teacher that Johnny has once again bitten him. Okay, but what happens in that moment, in the 30 seconds that it takes for Miguel to drop the ball and get to the teacher, guess what? Johnny got to play with the ball. And yes, Johnny got in trouble and got the ball taken away from him, but children get reinforced by things that happen immediately. He got 30 seconds with the ball. So what's the function of the behavior? It's access to something. And in this particular instance, it's access to the ball. Johnny's biting Miguel because it's what works. He doesn't have functional communication skills to say, it's my turn to play with the ball. Uh, and when, when Miguel says no, to negotiate that, right? So, but what gets the job done really quickly? I bite you, you give me the ball, we're all good. It doesn't matter that 30 seconds later the ball gets taken away. Instant gratification. Uh, okay. So we need to do some repair here. Our, our behavior intervention plan is going to start with giving Johnny functional communication skills so that he can request a ball, and when he does request the ball, that he's going to get it. We may need to buy an extra ball as we're teaching him so that Miguel can still play with the ball, but that when Johnny asks the ball, he gets a ball every single time to begin with. Uh, we're going to keep jo Miguel away from Johnny while we're doing this so that he doesn't have access to him to bite him. Um, and we're, we're going to try to just get there beforehand. They call that antecedent modification. Uh, Okay, and when, and he's also going to get reinforced when he goes on a certain amount of time without biting. So uh, we're we're going to lengthen that period of t that time. It's we're going to start with maybe it's just a minute. You know, he didn't bite for a minute, so he gets some sort of reinforcement. Um, and then we'll make it longer and longer and longer. But really important that we teach Johnny the appropriate skills to request the ball. And eventually over time, we're going to fade that as well so that every time he requests the ball, he doesn't get it. But until we've completely gotten rid of the biting, we're going to make sure he gets one every single time. Okay, let's look at a different FBA. Johnny bites Miguel when uh, Miguel is working quietly. When he bites, the teacher comes over and gives Johnny a lecture about biting. Sometimes he's given a timeout in the corner of the room. And while in timeout, the other students look and giggle and point at Johnny. So what's the function of the behavior here? And this one's a little tricky because you would think that while he's in timeout and the other kids are pointing and giggling and laughing at him, you would think that would be kind of a negative thing. But the truth of the matter is, that in this case it's attention and for kids who are attention driven it doesn't matter whether it's good attention or bad attention now the good news about when it's attention driven attention is one of the easiest things to fix because if the child is biting to get attention what you can do is start showering that child with attention before they bite attention I, you know as a teacher i loved it when a child was attention driven because you can fix that super duper easy you just have to get on an attention schedule and that's it uh, and you know, it's, I, I make it sound like it's all easy hearts and flowers. It isn't because you really got to be mindful of it. Um, but it's, it, it is the easiest one for me to fix. So I, when I hear, oh, it's attention driven, fabulous. Uh, okay. So the behavior intervention plan, first of all, we're going to have a, a regular dose of uh, attention. The teacher attempts to give Johnny more attention on a regular basis, gives him jobs, and praises him for doing well. Johnny is taught how to appropriately gain attention. We're going to see in a minute with Jack Riley that they're working on gaining attention. There was more last week's episode, but he is learning how to tap Jessica on the shoulder and say, Jessica, um, lots of different ways. That's just one way to appropriately gain attention. 
attention that, you know, somebody can say, excuse me and make eye contact, lots of different ways to get attention. And we really are going to fill Johnny with different ways that he can do that appropriately so that he's not going to bite to get attention. Um, and, but we're going to set up a schedule and, and give him things to do and give him lots of opportunities to get attention so that we can be constantly rewarding him. It might be that we're, you know, we might take a baseline to start and see that if we give Johnny attention once every minute, there's no biting, right? And you might think, okay, that's exhausting. Absolutely exhausting. What about when you have to answer the phone? What about when you have to, you know, use the restroom? You know, what are we going to do about that kind of thing? But very quickly, if we start giving attention every minute, um, very quickly, we're going to be able to go to a minute and a half. And then we're going to go to two minutes. And then we're going to go to five minutes. And then we're going to go to 10 minutes. And eventually we're going to get to an hour. Um, and this child will know if I am appropriately asking for attention any time during the hour, I can get it. But we won't have to be constantly delivering it. But in the beginning, you betcha we're going to. Um, and while we're doing that, we're going to limit Johnny's access to Miguel, of course, because we don't want Miguel to be the guinea pig that you know can potentially be bit while we're working this out. But again, teaching those replacement skills. You want attention, here's how you have to ask for it. And that's, I think, the toughest part of attention is that when the child is asking appropriately for attention in the beginning, you got to drop everything else and give it to them one way or the other. Uh, okay, and then uh, an, an important note that attention does not have to be positive to be reinforcing. All you have to do is look in the tabloids and see people who are engaged in, in behavior to get negative attention and they do it on a regular basis because they love of attention. Okay, last scenario, Johnny bites Miguel every day during the daily math quiz. After he bites Miguel, Johnny is given a timeout. He is sent to sit in the corner and is not able to finish the math quiz. What's the function of the behavior? Can you guess in this instance, by biting Miguel, Johnny is given an opportunity to escape the math quiz. For whatever reason, the, the math quiz is not happy making for Johnny. He doesn't want to do it. Um, um, so if he bites Miguel, he gets out of it. Now, something that's really tough for people to understand is that sometimes something is reinforcing to us, so we think it would be reinforcing to our child that, oh, you know, we're going to get in the car and go to grandma's, and you love going to grandma's, but you're getting ready to go, and that's when the child bites. And now you got to deal with the bite so you don't get out the door quite as fast, and it doesn't quite make sense to you, but it could be that the child doesn't like to go to grandma's. And by biting, they postponed it even for 30 seconds. Again, it's, if it's immediately gratifying, if it at all postpones it, the child is going to do it. The child, you, you know, go to put the child in the bath and you think bath, happy, happy, happy time, but the child bites and the bath gets put off 20 seconds. Well, then it's working, right? So behavior intervention plan. When escape is the issue, we have to figure out why this activity is something that the child wants to escape from. They call it being aversive. Why is the activity aversive? And how can we make that activity really fun? We got to turn it around and make that activity really reinforcing. It's kind of tough. But in the meantime, we also have to cut off the child's ability to escape it. <sighs> Take a deep breath, because this one is a hard one, right? We, if the child bites and you know it's, you're thinking, ah, I gotta stop and deal with this. No, whatever it was that you started has to happen anyway. And sometimes that's really tough. You want to make sure that nobody is, you know, you want to block things so that you're not getting bit more. But if escape truly is the issue, you have to make it impossible for them to escape that issue. Um, if it's that the child's taking a bath and the child bites you, they go right into the bath anyway. The child's going to try 35 other things and you're going to have a bit of a battle on your hands because if escape has been working for them, they're really not going to want to give it up. But you can't, you, you know, if you know that escape is the thing, you got to be prepared. Maybe you have reinforcements and you have a plan that's safe. And, but you can't let them out of it. My son used to do all kinds of things to escape doing homework. He, oh, didn't want to do homework. And I had to, you know, really clear the decks and to the point where, you know, if he would throw himself on the floor, I would get down on the floor with him and put my hand over his with the pencil and we would continue on as if nothing happened. And we had to do that for like two days before he went, clearly this isn't working. Oh, I was exhausted. 
I was really exhausted, but we, you know, it ended. Really tough risk with escape. You can't just decide to do it in the moment. You've got to know ahead of time, have your reinforcements, make it impossible for the child to escape, have it set up so that you're going to be able to follow through no matter what. But you also need to be working to make whatever the activity is less, of averse, less aversive. Okay, so you can see that depending on how your child is biting, you're going to go about this in a different way. But you have to know first, is the biting, child biting for attention? Is the child biting to get access to something? Is the child biting to get out of doing something? Or is the child biting because they like the sensation of it? Different interventions for each one. You got to have a replacement for the function of what it was that was so gratifying and you have to teach a new skill to be able to request the thing that they want to do. By the way, with escape, we're going to teach our children how to appropriately ask for a break. So if they're getting into the bath and they're biting you, they have to still go in the bath. But we teach them, hey, if you say in a minute or to hold up one finger if they're nonverbal to say, I need a minute. And that if you do that, you get a minute. The biting will stop and they'll hold up their finger. They're still not going to want to get in a minute later, which is why you got to work out how to make that bath fun. Okay, biting. We can stop the biting. We really, really can if we know the proper function and if we go about it in the proper way. Get uh, an FBA done and there's a new thing in skills that teaches you exactly, you, once you know what the function of the behavior is, it will help you to write the behavior intervention plan that's specific to your child for what's happening. It's amazing. We're going to cover that at some point. In any case, we got to take a break. I've gone on way too long. Um, uh, but we're going to show you the A word next. And as you're watching the A word, uh, I, I hope that you guys are enjoying this because I do. I love the A word. We're following a little boy, Jack Riley, who was diagnosed with autism uh, just after his second birthday, I believe. He's not yet three, but we've already seen tremendous progress. And I want you to notice as you look at this little boy, um, he looks different to me now than he did when he started therapy like six months ago. Go. He is making eye contact, he's communicating, he's interested in other people, he's playing alongside with people, he's excited to learn. Um, he is mostly a compliant child, but you'll notice that dad says we've made so much progress and then it hit the skids yesterday because he's asserting himself. Um, and you see dad having a level of anxiety because uh, he feels like they've taken a big step back. We'll see in the coming weeks that in fact, you know, you do take steps back, but it's always right before you take big steps forward. So take a look at the A word and see what Jack Riley's up to this week. through what he knows yet, but he might surprise me. I don't know. He always does. How old are you? Two. Oh, wow. Two like this? Can you Two. do it? Oh, that's a good try. Can you do the fingers? Can you try them? Two. There you go. What's your name? Tagway. All right, well, I guess he knows those. <laughs> hey, what's your name? My two. Yeah. <laughs> 
His mom was saying he was getting so excited that he's like discovering new um, like phonetic sounds on his own, like with things that he knows, like dinosaur, pancake. Hey, what's this one? Duh, duh. Good job. What about ba ba? Good job. the bike but doesn't play with it. Since he is no longer being compliant with Jessica, they leave, which begins a tantrum. Alright, okay, then we're all done. Then. We're all done then. Come on. Bike! Right. Bike! 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 B
Uh, that's what we, we, our term for it is elopement when a child escapes and they just run off, right? My child was king of this. I couldn't set him down anywhere, but he would just run, 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 run. Um, and in my child's case, and of course elopement, it can be a lot of different things. Sometimes a child is running to something because they want to see something. Sometimes a child is running away to get attention because they want somebody to chase them. Sometimes a child is running just because it feels good. And that certainly was the case with my son. He just liked to feel the wind in his hair. And he would have run to the far, you know, we, we laugh about there's a Forrest Gump element of my child. And eventually I took him and had him run on the track. <laughs> we just ran it out. Out of him um, but he just wanted to run it just felt good to be outside and run with no care no thought of anything uh, it's a really tough one to combat but what we did was take that feeling and put it some channeled at some place that was productive and useful because if you wear them out I have a really good friend who has raised two wonderful and of course they're they're completely neurotypical um, but they're fabulous, articulate teenage boys who are well-behaved. I'm sure there's something that they do that isn't wonderful, uh, but you wouldn't know it to look at them. They're just really fabulous, delicious young men. And that's hard in this day and age, is it not? And so we all say to their mom, you know, what's the secret of raising these happy and well-adjusted young men who are polite and, and well-behaved? And she says, you just got to run them like dogs, just wear them out. Um, and eventually, you know, I kind of glommed on to that with my son. I don't think that's the case for all of our kids, but, oh, you know, wear them out. Um, but in any case, uh, so Jack Riley, he wants to be on the tricycle, but then he gets outside and he wants to take off and they're saying to him, stop, and he's not listening. So it's time to go back inside um, because we're just going to remove, you know, if you're not going to listen, we're going to remove the ability to escape. And so they go back inside with the tricycle and he is not happy about the fact that his good time, party time has been taken away. Uh, we don't quite know what the function is here, but let's look at what the antecedent is. He's being told to come inside, right? And so the behavior is that he's whining and crying. And uh, at one point, he's even starting to be just like a little bit like he might move into being destructive, although he doesn't get there, but he's whining and crying and not happy. And the consequence is that dad gives it some attention and says, Jack, you know, Jack Riley, calm down, shh, right? And then the therapist says to dad, don't give it any attention. And he goes, oh, right, right. And then he gets into a discussion and you're watching and Jack Riley, <laughs> right? Um, and dad has given it some attention and we see a little bit of, <laughs> right? Because it got some attention. It was working. I got somebody paying attention to me. Uh, you know, maybe something good will come of that. But dad stops paying attention to the behavior and starts telling the therapist about what happened yesterday when Jack Riley engaged in some really challenging behavior. So what happens to Jack Riley's challenging behavior while dad's not paying attention to it and talking to the therapist? Do you notice? He sits down and plays a game because it wasn't working. So he stopped. <laughs> a perfect example of what happens. And as parents, I mean, don't, how much do I love this father? He's such a good dad, right? He's there and he's trying and he's trying to keep a sense of humor about it. And he says, ah, I blew it again, right? He says, ah, that's me trying to be the hero. And, and then he says, but yesterday was just terrible. And I, you know, we've had so much progress and I picture all of these things for my child and picture him, you know, being able to have this wonderful, normal life. And then out of nowhere, we get this challenging behavior behavior again. And that it just seems like it's this huge, huge mystery. And bless his heart, because that's how it feels to all of us when we're in it. What a wonderful, honest example. And can I tell you that, uh, you know, my son last night, I could not get him to go to bed for anything. And if you had come to my house, you would have said to me, Shannon, have you ever heard of ABA before? <laughs> You know, because I was too tired and I was not with it and I just was having great difficulty. And I remember going, what, why is this happening? Like it was this horrible thing that was suddenly happening out of left field to me. But when I thought about it this morning and thought, oh, well, hello, you know, how much attention did I give it? 
right? It's easy for all of us. And we have to forgive ourselves because sometimes we are too tired. And sometimes it just isn't going to be clear to us because we're in the moment and we're crabby or it's overwhelming or we're thinking, you know, I, I love this dad because he's so honest. He's saying, you know, I was thinking about, you know, someday he's going to be able to go on a date. And I was emotionally in this place of thinking progress. And then he did this. And so I was having to deal with all my emotion about, oh no, are we not going to be able to achieve those things? Because this is going to rear its head every once in a while, which that's reality, right? But it made him less able to deal with it in the moment. We have to forgive ourselves, right? But if we can learn from each other's mistakes and do the best that we can on any given day, and so the therapist is there to remind him, Mike, don't pay it any attention. And you notice when he didn't, it's over and the child is sitting and playing a game nicely and he's made the transition from being outside to inside. I love on America's Funniest Home Video that we they from time to time, it's like every year they have a new tape of this and you can go on YouTube and see them. Just put in child tantruming on Funniest Home Video. And and there are several of them. And it's it's neurotypical kids, right? Um, but we see the child throwing the tantrum. There's one, the little girl who arches her back and throws herself on the floor. And I, I just live in fear that she's going to crack her head open. Um, but the mom is standing there with the, the camera and videotaping the whole thing and laughing. Uh, and then she moves into the other room and the child sees that the camera doesn't, isn't picking up her every move anymore. So she drags herself over, sees where the camera is, stands up. And as soon as she sees the camera, throws herself back on the floor, right? It's attention. It's attention. And I, I love to watch that video because it reminds me that all kids throw tantrums, right? Um, what is hard for me as an autism parent is I don't understand the comfort with which the mom stands there and holds the video camera and is laughing at the behavior. That's so foreign to me because I don't know about you, I was always worried the tantrum was never going to end, that he was going to be 16 years old and outweigh me and throw in the tantrum and where were we going to be? And then I start stacking emotionally and go, you know, we're going to have to put him in an institution and he's not going to have the life and I, you know, I'm not going to be able to handle him and I'm not going to have control over the situation right? Just like that dad in the A word standing there and emotionally stacking the whole thing instead of looking at it and going, it's behavior. This is behavior. What is my child trying to tell me? Uh, and what is my child trying to get? It's really hard to see in the moment. And this is why working with BCBAs is really good because they can see the behavior from a 360 degree view without all of the emotion that we come with. But if we can start to, in the moment, I call it an emotional divorce from the behavior. We're separating ourselves emotionally from the behavior. Hard to do as a parent because you feel responsible for everything your kid says, does, and thinks, right? Not realistic, not, not accurate, not realistic and not helpful. But if we can take an emotional divorce and say that right there is behavior, has nothing to do with me. It's not a result of things I did or didn't do. That is behavior and behavior is communication. What's my child trying to communicate to me? Oh, okay. It seems like on a, on a moment's notice without doing a full FBA with a BCBA, it seems like, uh, my child's trying to get some attention here. And the smart thing for me to do would be to not give attention to this behavior. And let's keep in mind that not giving attention to a behavior is not the same thing as ignoring your child. We're going to ignore the behavior, not the child. A fine line, a dicey line, right? But if the child is screaming and sniveling and whatever, this is not the moment to say, hey, do you want some cookies? It would distract the child, that's true, but what the child will walk away with is, oh, when I whine and snivel and cry, I get an offer for cookies. I think I'll do this again. I'll revisit this cookie store, <laughs> right? We don't want to do that. So what we do, if the child's whining, sniveling, and da 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 we can go over and start to get cookies out and put them on a plate if that's the thing that's really reinforcing and be very calm, cool, and collected, be giving no attention to the cookie or to the, to the whining, sniveling, whatever. And we can even go over to the, the table and sit down and start to eat a cookie ourselves, uh, all the while knowing where the child is, uh, 
ha having visibility of the child but not staring at the behavior you can see out of the corner of your eye okay the child's still flipping out and you can see if the child is going to pull the TV off the you know the stand right and you're and you do want to move things out of the way if your child is that kind of person right but you're you know you might be getting the cookies out and getting the plate to go over and sit and have a cookie yourself well now the child sees you eating a cookie and not paying attention to them the child may approach you and want a cookie and when the child is calm completely calm and you have to you know give it at least three seconds where there's no crying or aberrant behavior at all but if there's three seconds go and can I tell you how many times as a mom I've had to go one two you know in my mind hoping for the three because sometimes you'll get to two and they go ah again and you got them back to your cookie right but you want to get at least three seconds and then then you can say to them oh would you like a cookie and you know the child is like cookie you know whatever and make sure that they properly request the cookie whether you're doing the sign for cookie or they're pointing to the cookie or whatever because what they learn is when I ask for the cookie I get the cookie and you just stepped past all this behavior and the child gets it together it's amazing how that can work um, but the key is not reinforcing the bad behavior, uh, but you can be doing something else and wait until you get three seconds. If you get three seconds, that's a great time to ask the child, do they want to do something else? Do you want to play a game? And, but three seconds have gone by that the child's been calm. Do you want to play a game? And if you know it's something that they find reinforcing, oh yes, and now we've sidestepped and they're getting attention, but they weren't getting it as a result of screaming and crying and doing whatever. It really is amazing. Um, and we'll see with Jack Riley that that's going to play out. Hey, by the way, you can be watching these episodes back from the beginning, the A word, and you can watch ahead. We're not to the end of uh, where they have edited up through. So there's the YouTube channel that you can go to to watch the A word. Uh, it's a wonderful series. You can really see the arc of what happens with the parents. You can see the arc of what's happening with this child. He's not done yet. Uh, so it's the beginning of the arc but you really begin to see oh my gosh this is how we teach a child skills how they go from here to here which means that there's so much that's possible I really hope that you'll watch it you'll see how his challenging behavior changes you'll see what they learn about challenging behavior it's wonderful all right you guys have been writing in for the question of the day we're gonna take a break and we're gonna come back and look at some of your viewer responses I love them stick with us Is a revolutionary web-based program that incorporates comprehensive assessment, curriculum design, progress tracking, and treatment evaluation for children with autism all in one place. Developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, our approach is based on over 40 years of research on the principles of learning and their application to improving the lives of children with autism. How does skills work? Created with speed and simplicity in mind, Skills was modeled on an easy three-step process. Step 1. Start Assessment Step 1 begins with our Intelligent Assessment System, which consists of a series of questions. This assessment is essential to identifying your child's level of skills compared to their typical peers across all areas of development. This includes assessing social, motor, language, adaptive, play, cognition, executive functions, and academic skills. Every skill has an assigned age which indicates when the skill emerges during typical development. This means that each child is automatically presented only with lessons that are relevant to his or her age. Step 2. Choosing Activities It's now easier than ever to build an individualized treatment plan. In Step 2, 
you are presented with an individualized pool of activities that are directly linked to your student's assessment results. Each activity represents a specific skill that has been indicated by the assessment as needing to be taught. Activities are categorized by curriculum and then by lesson. There are three main types of skills, building blocks, fundamental, and expansion skills. Fundamental skills are necessary for successful everyday functioning. Building blocks are prerequisites to a fundamental skill. Expansion skills are non-essential skills, but may provide further enrichment in certain areas. After reviewing the activities available to you, you can quickly add your chosen activities to the treatment plan by simply checking the box and clicking the button. Step 3. Start Treatment Once you have selected and added the activities you want, you are ready to begin teaching. Skills provide you with all the tools necessary to design and manage an effective curriculum plan, such as printable activity guides that are customizable by the teacher, supplemental teaching aids including printable data sheets, teaching guides, visual aids, worksheets and tracking forms, detailed IEP goals and benchmarks for each activity, brief and visually appealing video tutorials, a variety of treatment progress and clinical timeline charts, and lots more. And since Skills is completely web-based, everything you need is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in one easy-to-access location. Skills users even benefit from unlimited access to a support community, where they can ask questions and share ideas with a Skills expert. Skills is always with you. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. If you're just tuning in to today's show, we've had some technical difficulties and you're not able to... Oh, it is fixed now. Okay, so you can now uh, type in your response and we can get it in real time. But of course, as always, you can email, you can phone, you can Skype, lots of ways of getting in touch with us. Um, but now they tell me it is fixed that you can type in your question on the live forum before you if it says live. If you're watching this and it says recorded, then you want to go back to plan B, which is emailing, phoning, Skyping, whichever you prefer. We always have a question of the day and our question of the day today was what would you like to do that you haven't been able to do since your child was diagnosed and I love this you guys are answering this on Facebook we've already had a bunch of responses and what I love is that you put it out there and sometimes somebody has an answer which is great and the first person wrote it and said take a vacation do Disney no way she can wait on those lines and then makes a very unhappy face and I saw this and I was like oh no she doesn't know remember we talked about earlier today about the fact that they're you know that sometimes they're and I'm really getting to this category of parents who know and parents who don't know. And it's not a judgment because if you don't know, you don't know, right? But people start writing in and telling her the thing that she doesn't know, that there is allegedly, we always talk about this allegedly, uh, something that Disney does for you, that if you visit um, and you have a child on the autism spectrum, allegedly, we can't, uh, <laughs> there is a special pass. Uh, which makes it the happiest place on earth. Let's say that, allegedly. Uh, so we'll talk more about that as, as other people start to comment. But what a wonderful thing that, you know, she's thinking she can't go to Disney, but you really can. You really can. And not only that, people will want to go with you. Uh, it's a fabulous thing. It is the happiest place on earth. Uh, another person that says, travel more. His extreme eating challenges make it hard to do unless we bring the foods and brands he likes. Can't just hop on a plane and go. You know, that's a really tough one, especially with some of the new restrictions with what you can take on a plane and what you can't take on a plane. And we certainly have had our difficulties with that. Um, I think it's really important if, if we all look at those eating issues. And if you know that you want to go and travel a good six months before, targeting some of those things and figuring out what foods you can get on a regular basis. One of the things that we figured out 
a long time ago is because my son's on a very specific diet, right? He's allergic to a bunch of different things. So we're very gluten free, casein free and more. Um, but we discovered that my son's favorite thing on the planet is Subway grilled chicken. We're, they're very good about it when we go um, that he gets a salad with a Subway chicken on it. So and there are Subways in the United States anyway, every five feet. So uh, that's the one thing that I'm confident in when we go and travel that I can always get Subway and he's always gonna be thrilled. So he gets a salad and he gets his his chicken on the top and he is thrilled and they're very good about uh, preparing his salad and his chicken in a way that um, makes make sure that there's no allergen stuff. So um, finding the thing, you gotta have at least one thing. And we've tried to add some things uh, to our repertoire over the years to help us um, to be able to travel and having that little portable cooler and talking to TSA about what you can do to keep things cold. I know a couple of times they've confiscated our cold packs, but they've been very good about giving us a different one on the plane. So uh, there are ways. When there's a will, there's a way. But no, you can't just hop on the plane. You have to think ahead and plan more than any army general, right? But, you know, it is possible. Uh, somebody who writes in and says sleep and then LOL, bless your heart. Uh, I hope that somebody you know can give you some respite as soon as possible because the sleep is so important. Uh, but somebody writes in and says to the first person who wrote about the Disney, Disney has passes for kids with autism that let you bypass ride lines. And another person says Disney has special special passes that let you go to the front of the lines. Now, uh, let's be really clear and specific about this because, again, it's just alleged, right? Uh, we don't know anything specific. Um, but when you, I go to Disney on a regular basis. Um, and when you go, you want to stop in um, with you ask somebody at the gate where you go to get special needs passes. Um, but usually it is in the main on Main Street and California Adventure, it's in a little bit of a different place, but it's usually with guest services. So you can ask where guest services are. And you'll have to wait in a little bit of a line there, but it's worth it because when you get to the front of the line, you're gonna ask for a special needs pass, a special access pass. And what's gonna happen is, depending on which cast member you meet on that day, they're gonna ask you some very specific questions. And they're gonna say, why? Why do you need this the pass and if you say autism they're going to go say okay but what is it they're going to act like they've never heard the word autism before and that's what they've been trained apparently to do um but they're going to ask what behavior does your child engage in that you know they'll say well, what what happens if they wait in line and um you want to tell them the worst case scenario on your child's worst day ever right um that's just how you know, because that's what could happen at the end of a very long day. And so you're going to say, you know, my child can't handle small enclosed spaces for long periods of time and may it may result in injurious behavior towards themselves or someone else. And they go, OK, <laughs> we don't want that. And they pull into there, they get into their special. Allegedly, this is all allegedly, right? They pull into their special drawer and they get out this lovely little pass. I'll have to bring one in to show you and they'll stamp it. And they'll ask how many people in your party, and you can have up to six. And they'll ask you to sign uh, your initials that you understand that it does not get you to the front of the line. And you may have to wait just as long and potentially more, allegedly, right? And they give you this pass. And they'll, they now date it. So you can get it. Uh, used to be you could get it like if you were coming back for a couple of days, you could get it for a couple of days. But now they give it, I think, for two months, which is a wonderful thing if you have a Disney pass. Um, and then what happens is as you go to each ride, some rides are going to be better than others. But you'll go to the ride and you'll find the cast member who's working at the front of the line. And you say, where do I go with this pass? And usually they will dire direct you to where the ride exits. But for some of them, there's a special, you'll get the fast pass lane. For some, you'll go in the back and get right on the ride. It depends on how the ride was structured, how old the ride is, how, you know, they were able to accommodate those kinds of things. But it means that for most rides, not all of them, for most rides, the minimum, you're, you're waiting a minimal amount of time to get on the ride. It really is going to depend on how many other people are in the park that day with the pass 
how busy the park is and the individual ride. Um, but usually they try really hard to accommodate you and it does make the day ever so much more pleasant because I'll tell you what happens for us is that I see other people and they go to the park for 10 hours at a time. We couldn't possibly do that. That's too, 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 too much. Um, too sensory overload. It's just, uh, now I will tell you that just a couple of weeks ago I had somebody, um, uh, my niece visiting from out of town and we, we went and did the 12 hour tour at Disneyland and I think it's the first time that my son has ever been there that long because usually we go for four or five hours at a clip and what that pass allows us to do is to get on and off the rides very quickly so that we can get done in four to five hours what it would take somebody else eight to ten hours to do. So we've done Disneyland and we can leave before we get to full on I've had too much. Um, it's a wonderful thing and it's a fabulous thing that Disney does. I know other parks have something that they do as well, but it's, I, you know, I've been to all of the, the parks that are uh, amusement parks that are in Southern California. Nobody does it like Disneyland. It truly is the happiest place on earth. And there are people standing by to help you if you're having an issue and they're very understanding. You do have to get through that first conversation where they're going to act like they completely have never heard of autism. It's what they've been asked to do because you know, here's the good part about it is that they're, we don't just say autism and they go, oh, assumption that it's this, right? We're constantly saying, hey, it's not a cookie cutter, so we don't want it to be treated like a cookie cutter, although it is, you know, sometimes a little hard where they're going, well, you know, what exactly is the behavior? But just tell them. Okay. And then you get, allegedly, you get the fabulous Disney Pass. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Okay, another person who wrote in and said, Ha, go out on a date. Ever since she was diagnosed, it has been suspiciously harder to find someone to babysit. Oh, you're singing my song. Uh, even so, in lieu of the whole thing, we have found certain people in our family friends that are extremely supportive, which is especially wonderful when you are overwhelmed, beaten, and half asleep. Bless your heart. Even if we can't go on a date, at least we can talk for a while to someone who will listen. That's a wonderful thing. That's looking at the bright side here. Uh, take a trip, trip and read a book. Take a shower in peace and go to work without the school's calling or work, period. Uh, yes. Uh, another person who says, feeling like a mom and not a personal assistant. Yeah. I have a friend who refers to it as being the project manager for autism for her family. Uh, another person who says, bathroom and vacations. You know, if you plan ahead for the bathroom thing, that can work out too. That just means giving a preferred toy and setting yourself up so that you can go to the bathroom, truly. Uh, I like to talk about the fact that we made fun of a couple of weeks ago that Martha Stewart's daughter came out with a book and in her tell-all book told on her mother about the fact that she embarrassed her when she was a teenager because her mother doesn't shut the door when she goes to the bathroom. And I said, when she wrote this book, she must not have had children who were walking. I and she does now, and I'm sure she wants to take it back because anybody who has children who are walking and mischievous learns to never go to the bathroom with the door closed. And what are we suddenly supposed to when they're 16 start closing the door? It's a learned behavior. We'd have to do some behavior mod to get there, right? Um, so you leave the bathroom door open, but you can have a minute to go to the bathroom if you plan accordingly. Uh, finding the right activity for your child to do. I know people who will take, you know, I had to do this before when, back when we had the video players that were huge and not the, the phones, I'd bring my child in, sit him there with the thing so that I could take a shower and have him sit in the bathroom. I could see that he was there. He was watching his video. All was well. Uh, but it does take planning. Okay. Uh, another person who writes in and said, there's many things I could do. Uh, God send me an angel. Uh, therefore, if I can't do other things, uh, then I just don't. Uh, one day with help of, with the help of God, uh, my child will be independent and I will get to do my own things. I hope you get some help now though, some people so that, because you don't want to postpone everything. Our children are wonderful and we build our lives around them. I know I, I feel the same way, but you don't want to lose yourself. It's really easy to do. Uh, another person who says, uh, vacations are trouble. Too many people don't understand the meltdowns. Uh, this is true. This is true. 
another person who said, God gave me this job for a reason. Uh, there are days I want to yell and scream and pull my hairs out, uh, but I close my eyes and count to 10 and be thankful for my twin angels. Bless your heart. Uh, another person who says, the only thing I feel we can't do is get a babysitter and have date nights. Yes, again, I, you know, I, I, I've got people working on this to solve this. I'm very paranoid. And since he couldn't tell me if the person was horrible, I can't even attempt it. I'm feeling you. Uh, he's also very attached. So huge separation anxiety. Yes, this is the case in my family too. Only it's on my side. <laughs> The only person I trust watching him is my mom, and she's 10 hours away, so it's rare. Yes, I, we're working on this. Truly, we are. Um, uh, another person who says, and again, the question was, what would you like to do that you haven't been able to do since your child was diagnosed? Another person who says, not worry about the future so much. We haven't been able to do movies or anything like that since he was born. The diagnosis just triggered anxiety about how his future will look and what will happen to him once we're gone. Oh my, are you singing my song? Uh, I started having, uh, I, this is when I say to you guys, you got to make sure that you get rest and you got to take care of yourself or you will make yourself sick and that's exactly what I did I started having panic attacks um, and I did cognitive behavior therapy and that's what helped me and it made sense my son was getting ABA and so cognitive behavior therapy and what I realized uh, in a session was that I was so terrified about everything that I had no control over that, that I was trying to take control over things that didn't make sense um, and I finally I remember sitting there and spitting out in tears and saying to the therapist, I just want to keep him safe. I just want to duct tape him to the wall so that he's safe. He's moving out in the world and, you know, I, I can't control what's going to happen to him. Um, we have to deal with those anxieties. We have to. It's so important for our kids. It's so important for us um, to find the way to be at peace. It's hard. There's no guarantees ever, right? And sometimes, you know, we know statistically our kids are more likely to have a whole host of bad things happen to them. But we have to move forward. We have to be able to give them the skills. We have to be diligent and not lose ourselves in the in the pile of anxiety because it binds us up and it binds them up. But darling, I hear you on the anxiety thing. I really do. Been there, done that, still struggle with it, but ever so much better. Uh, and, and we can get better thinking about it. Uh, another person who says, my son loves trains. I want to take him on a real train ride. What a great idea. Uh, to him, it will be the, mo the most greatest thing in the whole world. Since he was diagnosed with autism, uh, trains are what he loves the most, keeps him calm and very happy, which makes me happy. That's what I would like to do. Well, my goodness, there, uh, get yourself a train ticket because that sounds like a really exciting thing. Uh, oh, another person who wrote in and said that they haven't been able to paint, that they would like to be able to paint. It's wonderful. You know, you say it, you speak it. These things will happen. Uh, another person who says, I would love to take a vacation at the beach in a house with beachfront access and be able to take the kids. They have never seen the ocean, and I think they have overcome sensory issues enough that they would really love it. If they get tired of it, we could go right in the house and take a break without being a major pack it all up and walk back to the car, etc. Add in a pool at the house. I love this. We're dreaming now, right? Uh, add in a pool at the house or a jacuzzi, and that would be the icing on the cake. Hey, a girl can dream, right? You betcha. It's good to dream. Uh, Okay, so another person says go to a concert or go on a vacation. Um, an, uh, another person writes in and says, I don't like that these are negative. Can we have questions? I'd love to answer some questions related to wonderful things about my child. We try to cycle in between all those different things. Uh, so we'll get back to that. Uh, another person says have an overnight trip with my husband. I don't know what that looks like. What you talking about? That's, that's just wow. 
mind-boggling to me. Uh, another person who says, I go on at least two vacations a year with my autistic son. Uh, he has esophag an esophagus issue, so he's limited on what he can eat, plus he's picky. But I find my hotels based on what is around them, such as a grocery store where I can buy his favorite foods and drinks, or I pack them in a cooler. We've been to Disney, and they bend over backwards to make it perfect. We've been to the beach, amusement parks, etc. Many of them have guest assistant pass, like Disney, where you can bypass lines or wait in a quiet area away from people. Disney also has that, by the way, um, that they will offer for one person to stand in line for the whole family or a quiet place to stand in line where then you get fed in. Uh, if we can take care of all of these kids' needs, go without much sleep. A vacation is nothing if you plan ahead, people. Uh, you can do it with an exclamation point. She writes in, stay at a hotel like Staybridge. I don't know what that is. You get a full kitchen so you can cook the them their favorite foods and have a separate living room and bedrooms for space and privacy. I do agree how hard it is to get a babysitter for date nights. My hubby and I do miss going out for dinner or a movie. We just wait for a movie to come out, get it from Redbox, and watch it while he's at preschool. That's lovely. Uh, another person said that they would like to be loved back. And... You know what I want to say is that I am sure that you are. I'm sure that you are. But what I want to wish for you is that you feel it, um, at which really is important, right? Uh, and another person says, to be able to hear my son say I love you or even mommy, be able to have support from my family and not get told every day that it's my fault my son has autism by family members. Will you know what I say to that? There are some people in your life that on this journey through autism, you need to say bye bye to for a while. And if somebody is telling you that this is in any way your fault, bless your heart, come over here to our club and let some other people work out whatever their issue is someplace else. They can go stand in a different line, but you don't need that. That's not helpful. And if you don't want to, you know, sometimes you can say to people, that's not helpful and they'll get it together. And other people, it just becomes more any energy wasted. Um, so take a look at that, but don't allow yourself to be dragged down by people who don't get it and aren't going to get it and have something else going on. Bless you. It is not your fault. You're awesome. Okay, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about teaching cognition and how teaching our children about feelings is going to help them with their challenging behavior. So stick with us. Back in a minute. I'm Adele Nadowski, Director and Co-Creator of Skills. Card eLearning is an online tool that has been developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Card eLearning is the training that is delivered to the ABA therapists at CARD to train them on the principles of applied behavior analysis and to equip them with the knowledge they need to essentially deliver the ABA-based techniques during their therapy with the children that they work with. ABA has been proven scientifically to be the most effective intervention for children with autism. At this point, even the Surgeon General has come out with a statement suggesting just that. So we know that this is something that children with autism definitely need if they're going to improve and um, live the lives that we're hoping that they're going to be able to live. By being able to train people on this one particular method that we know works and to be able to have all of your staff within your school settings on the same page, it allows you to take more of a multidisciplinary approach and there's definite consistency going on within the team. It makes sure that every person involved with that child's treatment program, including the speech and language pathologist, the occupational therapist, the teachers, the aides, all of these individuals to be able to be trained so that they can all work together effectively with the child. <coughs> Parents that are using CARD eLearning can use it either to train themselves and then after having done that they can implement uh, different techniques with their child in order to teach new skills. 
Um, but oftentimes parents might also be working either with an ABA provider, with a school, or they may have even hired their own therapist to deliver the intervention techniques. So CARD e-learning can be used um, either to collaborate with your school, it can also be used to train the therapists that are coming to the home of the parents, uh, or it can also be shared with the ABA provider so that that provider can find out about it and perhaps implement it within their organization and train their staff. You can also do um, reporting for your organization. So you can actually look and find out which teachers are progressing, what their quiz scores are, and actually we can give you reports as well that will help you to compare the different teachers and their performances. Card e-learning is really, really simple to use. You can log on to this as long as you have a computer, that's all you need, and an internet connection and you can work on it any time of the day anywhere that you're at. When you log on you realize that right away. First of all um, on the top of the page there's a navigational tutorial. It's a how to use this page button. Simply by watching that video it'll all kind of unfold in front of you and it becomes extremely self-explanatory. Um, Cardi Learning has nine modules and you can basically go through those at your own pace. Um, you're going to be watching videos that are kind of like um, a storyboard with narration, but in addition to that, there's many different video clips of therapists actually implementing the techniques that are being described within the storyboard that you can also watch. And then, of course, you're able to pause, you're able to type notes right directly underneath the video that you're watching. You can save your notes, you can review them, and um, between each module, you do take a quiz and once you pass that quiz you can go on to the next module and then after you complete all of them you have a final exam and by completing the final exam and passing with a score of 85 percent or better you will be given a certificate of completion let me show you how easy it is to use cardi learning Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and I want to take a minute. We've been talking about challenging behavior. We're on the Challenging Behavior Marathon today, and we are going to talk some more about some specific, that's a hard word to say today, specific <laughs> challenging behaviors and how we're going to target them. Um, but when we're working on challenging behavior, there's always something that we want to teach to help the child. We know that if, if all behavior is communication, um, and that challenging behavior is usually communication with an exclamation point, right? Because needs are not being met, whatever they are. And that's usually a part and parcel of why the challenging behavior is happening. So we always want to be coming along and teaching functional behavior, uh, functional, excuse me, functional communication skills so that the child doesn't have to engage in challenging behavior. And we want to be giving the child an understanding of the things that are happening around them and maybe in some cases a little bit of control so that they don't feel um, you know it's really hard when you feel like you have no say in anything if you have no control over your circumstances and you're not in any way shape or form driving the bus it can make you cranky right this is true for us as well why would we think it be any different for our children um, imagine you know I mean we all kind of laugh and say oh how cushy and nice it would be to have somebody else prepare your meals and clean up the dishes for you and everything but if you have no say in it and so they're putting stuff in front of you on a regular basis and telling you what to do and here we're getting in the the car now and we're it would get old really fast right even if you had somebody really good taking care of you who loved you and was interested in your needs if you had no ability to have a say in things you would start to get a little on the cranky side a little crabby pants I think um, again technical terms crabby pants right <laughs> so um, as we're looking at the challenging behaviors and as we're looking at the functions of the challenging behaviors we're always trying to shore up necessary skills so that we can be putting other things in place so that the challenging behavior isn't necessary. Ah, what a wonderful thing. So I wanted to take a quick minute and we talk about language all the time and teaching manding and how important it is when the child can request things we'll see immediate drop in some of the challenging behaviors because it's much easier if you can say juice and somebody gives it to you as opposed to flinging yourself around the kitchen and throwing things and maybe you get the juice or maybe you get something else you know saying juice much more effective right it just goes without saying but there are other things that we can do too 
in other areas. And so I brought up cognition because in the cognition curriculum, we start to talk about feelings and desires and thoughts and beliefs and those kinds of things. And today I wanted to take just a, a quick second to talk about feelings and for a child to begin to understand their states. Um, because if we can get to the point where a child can say, I'm hungry, then that whole set of tantrums that happens when the child is hungry goes away, right? Um, now, this is true of adults and people who are not on the spectrum as well. Uh, if you know somebody, if you know and love somebody in your life who has low blood sugar <laughs> issues, and I'm laughing because there is somebody that I know and love in my family, and it's the big joke in my family that if, and, and, you know, and you know who you are if you're watching. Uh, but there's somebody who is not a teenager at all um, in my family and when and she does have low blood sugar and when she says I'm hungry we need to eat something we have learned over the years and this is somebody who is not on the spectrum at all you guys uh, I won't say her name but her initials are my mother and but I didn't say that okay so in any case if my mother says I'm hungry you guys we need to stop and eat it is time to stop and eat and it is the big joke in my family about how sometimes we forget this. Um, and my mother won't always say it really loud. She might just go, you know, I'm getting hungry. Uh, but I have learned over the years that that is the time if you're in the car and she says that you pull over at the next exit. You don't start like thinking about, well, do we want to stop in the next hour? You pull over at the next exit if you have to find a grocery store, if you have to go to a gas station and you put something in her hand that can go directly into her mouth because it will go places that you don't want to go if you don't feed her. Um, and we all know children that are that way too. I, I am one of those people who I get distracted by something. I, and I do this on a daily basis. Trust me, I get doing something and clearly, you know, I eat more than I should. Right. But I can go hours on end and forget to eat if I'm doing something that really has my attention. And then all of a sudden I don't feel good and I don't know why. And it's been 12 hours since I've had anything to eat and I'm, you know, feeling lightheaded and, uh, and, and crabby. Oh yes. Right. Right? Um, we wouldn't, and I always say, I would never do that to my child. I would never have an expectation. If my child was in the middle of something and it had been five hours since he'd eaten, I would interrupt him and stop him and make him eat so that I wouldn't get to the tantrum, right? Why I don't do this for myself, you know? Uh, but I have learned in the case of the person in my family, uh, my mother, uh, she says she's hungry. It's time to stop and eat that, that, you know, that is an antecedent that needs to be addressed right then, or we will get challenging behavior from my mother and we don't want that. Right. Um, and I can remember when my son was little and, and I was doing my three column thing and doing antecedent behavior consequence that I, um, could see if we messed it all with his meal time, that became an establishing operation. Establishing operation is a little bit, uh, bigger than an antecedent because it's something that either makes it more likely that you're going to be able to accomplish something or less likely that you're able to accomplish something. So if you're underslept today, right? That's an establishing operation. It means that everything that you do today, you're probably going to be less likely to be successful than if you got a good night's sleep, right? So that's an establishing operation. And we want to make sure that establishing operations are going the direction that we want them to go in, right? But we can't be mind readers all the time. And I know you guys write in and how frustrated you are sometimes that your kids can't tell you what they're feeling. Well, there is a lesson in skills and I love to use skills. This is what I personally use at home now working with my son because ABA is done. Our, our ABA program is done uh, with having therapists come into the house. So it's us now working with my son with skills. And there are lessons in uh, the cognition curriculum that are just about teaching children what feelings are, how to express them, what a feeling feels like. And it's really exciting because they go about it like they do everything else. The lesson plan shows you how to get a global understanding of feelings 
that you there are things where you're looking at pictures of people and looking at their facial expressions and determining what are they feeling. Uh, you take pictures of your you can you know as one of the different things if your child needs support in this area take pictures of your child kind of like what Temple Grandin's mom and aunt did for her taking pictures of Temple's face making different faces and showing her you know this is what it looks like when you're angry and this is what it looks like when you're sad and this is what it looks like when you're hungry and this is what it looks like when you're sleepy um, and we start to put words to these things with our children and they start to understand not only do they have things going on but other people do too and we very slowly start to build towards uh, perspective taking so that the child can understand just because you're hot doesn't mean that this person next to you is hot just because you're hungry doesn't mean that I am um, but giving them the words to language it um, I shared that I had watched a couple of months ago the A word with my son and we were watching it on my phone and I was showing him the video and Jessica the therapist in the A word was one of our therapists as well as well and he recognized her hasn't seen her in years but he recognized her and he looked at the little boy and said is that me I said no 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 that's not you it doesn't even look anything like you when you were a baby but in any case he was watching and at one point the mom was talking about how hard it was when Jack Riley fusses during the lesson and uh, that it makes her weepy and and feel bad and that she you know she knows he's okay but she worries about him and uh it's hard to hear your child not being happy right and sometimes when we're teaching uh and it's something new children who don't have a way of expressing themselves are unhappy and they cry uh, for the most part they're thrilled to do aba but sometimes you know you'll run up against things and they're not happy about it and so the mom is saying how weepy she is and and my son was saying well why why is she so upset and we were talking about it and i and he said to me he asked me he said when I was getting therapy, were you ever outside the door and, and upset? And I said, yes, when you would cry, I would sit on the other side of the door and I would cry. And, and it was really hard for me to hear you cry. And he said, oh, mom, I was okay. I was just frustrated. I was just frustrated to hear this out of an eight-year-old's mouth. Um, and there are times now, it's so interesting to me because he really learned about emotions um, and he recognizes in, in himself and in other people and he names them and he does it much faster than myself or my husband does. That, uh, you know, I was really crabby yesterday and he said, Mom, you know, you're really crabby today. Although uh, he used a different term for it because he's, he's doing uh, super flex at school right now. And so he said, you're really being glass man right now. Uh, and if that's a term you guys are familiar with, if your child is doing super flex at school, you know what I mean. But, uh, you know, and he said, boy, you, and, and then I said, what do you mean? I don't understand what glass man. And he goes, oh, it's when you're just really sensitive to everything. He said, you're a little on the crabby side. What's going on? Uh, from an eight year old boy, right? Pretty amazing. But same thing for him that there was one day that we came home and we'd been out way too long and it was hot. And my husband and I were just, you know, we hadn't had lunch and we were, rah, 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 rah. and I, I asked my son, son to do something and he said, you know what, I'm really hot and I'm really tired and I'm really hungry right now and I'm feeling a little crabby. And both my husband and I kind of stopped and we were like, oh yes, that's what I'm feeling too. That's what you can get to. That level of self-awareness and of feelings in them, themselves and in others by doing these kinds of lessons in the cognition curriculum. It's all there for you. And honestly, you know, we saw that when he began to understand these, we had another decrease in challenging behaviors because when it's, when somebody can say, I'm really unhappy right now, and I really feel frustrated with the fact that you're not listening to me, that takes the place of hitting, kicking, biting, swiping things, throwing things. Um, it's just amazing uh, that those kinds of things go away when somebody has the words to say, I'm feeling this way. And once somebody can say, and this is true for us and our kids, once somebody can say, I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling angry, it's amazing how everything kind of changes. Oh, that's right. I'm having an emotion. I'm having an emotion. I'm not going to die from it, but I want to convey to you, this is where I am. And everybody goes, okay, 
okay, well, that's where we, we, I, you know, you have been heard. You are angry and I understand that. Um, and let's talk about what we can do about with that. It just changes everything. So working on feelings and, and again, you'll see there's some great teaching tips in there about how to help the child to understand their own feelings and how to set up circumstances so that, you know, we first model and say, I'm feeling cold, you know, you, whether it, you know, it could be in the summer and you visit someplace that it's very cold and say, oh, it's cold in here, just for them to understand and that is absolutely amazing. Uh, but to understand their personal feelings too and their states of being, to be able to say, I'm tired. <sighs> what a lovely, lovely, lovely thing. Um, because otherwise they have to exhibit in behavior and often it's challenging behavior. Okay. We've got to take a break, um, but when we come back, we're going to talk about the really tough one, self-injurious behavior uh, and all the different forms that it takes and what we can do about that. It's probably the most worrisome thing that there is. So we're going to talk very seriously about it. Stick with us. We're going to be back in just a minute. Hi, we're here today with Cecilia Knight, who is the Director of Training for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And today I'm thrilled to have her here because we're going to talk about manding. What is manding? A request um, that you would make of another person. Why is manding one of the first things that seems to come up in most programs? Okay. Um, well, a baby um, requests for his mother's attention by crying or by reaching. And so it's one of the first ways that you let another person know what you need. Mm -hmm. And then that other person reinforces you by either picking you up or giving you something to drink or something to eat. And so many of our clients um, aren't really good at that once we start a program with them. And unfortunately, um, many of them engage in inappropriate manding. Um, screaming, kicking, biting. And so what we're trying to do early on is no longer reinforce the inappropriate ways of asking and rather reinforce the appropriate ways of asking. And as we teach them an appropriate way to ask for, um, mom, play with me, um, can I have juice, or you know, even more simply, help, um, then we see those inappropriate mans decreasing and the appropriate mans increasing because um, the child's wants and their desires um, aren't really changing, but we're teaching them the right way to get their needs met. So manding doesn't have to actually be spoken. It can be nonverbal right. as well. And um, that's exactly right. They could exchange an icon. And if I bring you an icon with a cup on it and hand it to you, and you bring me um, a juice cup, then we've made an exchange. And so there is what Skinner would call verbal behavior. You have reinforced um, my request for a cup or for juice. So when we say verbal behavior, we're not talking about vocal behavior necessarily. That's right. It's just that it's a conversation of some sort. What is reinforcing to the child? The man is evoked by the child's desire or um, their need for something. So early on, we may arrange the situation where I know that they're interested in the juice and they're reaching for it. I may um, hold it back um, to just say, say juice or ja or whatever is appropriate for that child. And then as soon as they emit any sort of response, give a high level of praise and then immediately give them the juice. But what controls the man is that specific reinforcer. So of course, if the child asks for a juice cup and you bring something else, then they're not being reinforced with what they asked um, to have. Okay, what do you want? What do you want? Wait for, Good job. You say wait for please? Wait for please, good talking. Thank you, dad. Thank you, daddy. Welcome back to Autism Live. Uh, 
want to talk a little bit about self-injurious behavior because this is something that we will see sometimes with children on the autism spectrum. So if a child is doing anything to hurt themselves, and this could be from scratching themselves to uh, cutting, if you have kids that are older, this can be banging a head against the wall, um, you know, a whole host, way too many things to, to bring up, and they're all nightmare quality right I you know how how you rate things in terms of how disturbing I I, I don't know um, you know and it's terrible when a child is violent and they're sending their violence towards other people and that's upsetting and unsettling in its own way but self injurious behavior is I, I think it takes it to another level entirely because when we sit and say to parents uh, and, and I know when people were saying this to me well there's a function for that behavior and you just you know your stomach kind of turns and you go what how explain that to me you know I, I was amazed last uh, September we had Mike Dorsey, Dr. Mike Dorsey with us, and we're hoping to have him back again soon. In fact, we were hoping to have him today to talk about this, but uh, he was not able to be with us today, but we will have him back in the studio soon. And he is an expert um, on a bunch of different things, but in particular, he gets called to testify a lot about the appropriate setting for children on the autism spectrum, that sometimes schools will hire him to testify, and other times it's parents that hire him to testify, and he teaches at Endicott College as the head of their behavior program there. Really, really knowledgeable guy, and what I found fascinating, you know, whenever I interview any of these experts, I always like to know, how did you get here? How did you end up in this field of autism? Like, you know, what was that day like? You just you know, woke up when you were eight and went, oh, I want to work with people who are aut have autism. I, you know, it, never do we hear that answer, right? But it's always interesting the path they find to work with individuals with autism. And what I was really struck by uh, was that he said that he started to learn about the function of a behavior, and this just really made sense to him, and he found it really deeply interesting as a person. So he got into behavior for that, not specifically autism. But while he was working in this field, he was particularly fascinated by self-injurious behavior because it was so difficult to understand. And that led him down a path where he began to work with clients who had autism. So, uh, and he was saying, you know, because we can look at everything else and it really starts to make sense that you go, oh, well, of course, well, we engage in behaviors on a regular basis because there's something about it that's reinforcing, but that was really hard for him to wrap his head around in terms of self-injurious behavior. So he spent a great deal of time researching and finding out how to do, and, and really being part of a team that wrote the criteria for how to do a functional behavior assessment um, safely when we're talking about self-injurious behavior. And this is what, where we get to the crux of the issue here. When you're dealing with something where there is the potential for harm, whether it's a child being violent towards another person, but especially when it is violence towards themselves, even if it seems like in your head in this moment, well, it's not that bad. Um, let's say that the child is engaging in, in uh, self-injurious behavior because they're just scratching themselves. They're scratching themselves to the point where they're drawing blood and have the potential to leave scars. I think even then, you really want to call in help. Um, and I know it's easy in that moment to go, well, they're just scratching themselves. It's not the same thing as if they were beating their heads against the wall. But let me, let me put this into your mix, that there is a reason why the self-injurious behavior is happening. And we don't know what it is. We can suppose and suppose and suppose, but a lot of times it's going to come, not always, okay, and we can't assume, but a lot of times self-injurious behavior is going to come in under that self-reinforcing, that there is some element of it that feels good, and that's a dangerous path to be in. If hurting yourself, if there's an element of it that feels good, it, that kind of thing can escalate very quickly, and you don't want to let it go. So on the one side, I really want to put, I know, you know, we don't want to be in fear and anxiety, but this is one place where we need to be in fear and anxiety and get 
uh, an expert. And by an expert, I'm talking about a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism and has experience with self injurious behavior of the nature of what you're dealing with. And those are the things that you want to ask them before you contract with them to help you. Cause you, that's not the time to be working and having your child be a guinea pig because somebody just got their BCBA, hasn't really worked with kids with autism, hasn't really worked with self injurious behavior. This is not the moment, right? You could do that with crossing the street, maybe, um, because you know that it's going to follow a pretty, you know, succinct, this is different. Get an expert who already knows how to deal with this kind of thing and has dealt with this kind of thing successfully. Do yourself a favor. Do your child a favor. Okay. Um, but on the other side of things, what I want you to know is that it may be, and it is sometimes, not always, that there is something that is so easily fixable that you can turn this behavior around like that. And think about how badly you're going to feel if, even if it's something where you say, well, it's just my child scratching themselves and they just draw blood, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It's not like, you know, they're, they're hurting themselves to the point where they could do permanent damage. But think about if you find out that it is so minute and so fixable that you could take care of it in an afternoon and your child would never do that again. And how bad you will feel if you wait two months or two years to take care of that. Um, and how much it can escalate in that amount of time. So whatever you have going on, um, if, if there is self-injurious behavior happening, it needs to go right to the top of the list, right to the top of the, to, to the list to get help, to have somebody come in, f take a look at it, come up with a behavior intervention plan. You need to know what the function of it is. And when you're dealing especially with self-reinforcing and self-injurious, that combo platter, you really need to have an expert, absolutely need to have an expert. If you don't know who to, who to go to, here are some suggestions. First of all, you can go to www.centerforautism.com. Go to the location tab, see where the closest office to you is. If it's three countries away, call it. Call it anyway. Call the nearest office to you and say, here's what's going on. You know, do you have anybody that services my area or can you recommend anyone? Okay, that's, I think that's the best place to start. But in addition to that, I'm always telling you guys to have a local support group and a global support group, right? This is a great case for the local support group. If you, and find one that fits your, your schedule and your way of communicating, I have them online because I'm too busy to meet at a specific time on a specific day. My child's too busy for me to do that. If I relied on that, I would never have a support group. Um, but I get a daily um, message from all the people that are in my support group about what they're asking about, what they're talking about, and I can ask the question. So I can sit here at 11, 10, and I can type in a question and say, who would you guys go to to get a functional behavior assessment for headbanging? Or who would you call to get a functional assessment for pulling their hair out? Or whatever the self-injurious behavior is that they're doing. Um, and people are going to, in your local support group, are going to say, well, you know what, we had that and we used so-and-so. You're going to get some answers that are not going to be useful to you, but you'll get some that are useful to you. But again, also, I encourage you to go to centerforautism.com, click on the locations tab, go through, find the one that's closest to you. They're going to be a great resource for you one way or the other. Um, and you can call the number and say, here's what I need. Shannon said to call toss my name in there. Shannon said to call. I'm dealing with self-injurious behavior. I need some help. I need to know who I can get in. I need a BCBA. They'll talk to you about it. Okay. So we never, ever, ever want to let self-injurious behavior go ever. Um, and if you're okay, here's the other part of it. If you're saying, well, I see that it's a problem, but I've got no help. I've got no support. I've got no money. Uh, I still want you to call the center for autism and related disorders and talk to them about that. And in the meantime, I want you to put in a grant to act today. 
uh, put that grant in there and say, I need help, my child's engaging in, in that, this self-injurious behavior and I don't know what to do about it and I need to get a BCBA in here. CARD has something called SOS, Specialized Outpatient Services, and they travel the world. Um, and and they exactly, you know, it's like there's, there's so many different divisions of CARD, but there's one division that does therapy, right? That they go into people's homes, they bring therapists in, and they do therapy. There's Another, another division that does workshops that uh, a supervisor will fly to where you are or drive to wherever you are and they will help you to train your team that you hired and they'll help you to design your program. You can do cardi learning and skills and you can do that with some consultation so that you have somebody who's helping you to work through some things long distance. You can do all of those things. But then there is SOS, Specialized Outpatient Services, for people who you've got a big problem and you need to target it and you need to solve that problem sooner as opposed to later. And then you can talk about doing any of the other things, but first you gotta make sure that the child is eating or first you gotta make sure that the child can take their medication or first you gotta make sure that the child isn't hurting themselves or hurting anybody else. And you gotta make sure that the child is sleeping, right? Sometimes these issues are huge. Let's take a break and we'll be back in just a minute. When Maddie was diagnosed, I'll be honest, I was very ignorant on what autism was. I knew that autism was basically something that hit boys at the age of two to three and they shut down. And sometimes you think of the typical Rain Man uh, movie. Um, and with Maddie, she was doing all the same signs and symptoms of a, of a typical child with autism spectrum disorder. Stand up. didn't even acknowledge us coming into the room. Um, she had barely any eye contact. Um, she didn't interact with her sister. She didn't really do anything. She just basically lined up her toys and that was about it. We have a team of seven volunteers, or, or eight now, eight volunteers, including my husband and I. And I'm the team leader, and so I do all the curriculum and get everything ready each week. Jana was downstairs until 11 o'clock at night working on curriculum, going through two different textbooks. And then we, as a group, meet on Monday nights, and we would go through what the curriculum was from Jana. And a lot of times we would go, well, how exactly do you do that? How do you sit her at the table and, and do this trial base? Well, what skills has done for us, it's, it's taken that away from Jana trying to figure out the curriculum for one, she can go down, or on our, even on our laptop, and she can sit down and through all these questions, it comes up with the different programs. At least for me, it was a relief off my shoulders. I was worried that I might be missing something, um, missing a curriculum that maybe she needs to know, where skills, they have every, every possible thing your child needs to know from zero to seven. They have a program for that. What noise is this? <laughs> Every program that we did with her, I knew it was specific for what she needed to learn. Because before skills, it was a lot of, okay, well, is that really age appropriate for a two-year-old? You know, because it's not generalized. It's anywhere from zero to seven. This is what your child needs to know in most, in most manuals you'll find. Um, but for this, okay, yep, yeah, she should be learning this. And no, she's not four yet. She doesn't need to know that yet. We are so fortunate that Jana was able to attend a conference put on by CARD that opened the door for skills and that um, there's no looking back for us. We started using the program in November. It seemed like by January something just clicked and she has completely kind of came out of her fog that she was in for quite a while. I have never read a documented case on any child that has not benefited anything from applied behavior analysis and uh, now with this new skills and being you know, like the E version of ABA, I can't imagine it doing anything harmful to their child. It, it's nothing but exponential growth for us. To see her now, it, is, it just blows us away I and mean, we call her our little miracle child because 
Um, in seven months' time, she has just blossomed into this normal, functioning child, and suddenly, we joke about it all the time, like suddenly we have twins. If you're even thinking about doing it, do it. Because the absolute worst thing you can do is do nothing at all. And even if you use this program and it's just a single mom or a single dad working in the evenings with their child, this program is going to benefit them. It's, it's going to show you where they are, it's going to show you where they need to go, and it's going to show you what skills and how to get there. It is an online book on how to help recover your child. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're going to take just a, a brief minute here to talk about tantrums because it's Challenging Behavior Marathon Day, right? We're talking about all the challenging behavior, looking at it as uh, uh, a three-term contingent. There is an antecedent, something that happens before. That's the A of our ABCs. There's a behavior, and then there's a consequence. So we're going to look at tantrums in this segment and meltdowns in the next segment. <laughs> if you don't know the difference, stick around. I'm sure you actually do, but uh, we'll talk about it. Okay, so tantrums in particular. We've talked about this a little bit earlier today. Uh, I, I want for all of us as autism parents to know that they are a normal part of childhood development. I know. <laughs> I know. There's something about that that we go, no, I don't, I don't want to be in acceptance about tantrums. Well, I don't want you to be in acceptance about tantrums either. I want you to be in acceptance about the fact that it is going to happen and that it is a normal part of development and that we aren't going to, I mean, I look at Jack Riley, the little boy in the A word, and we've seen that some of his tantrums went away, right? And now he's on to new kinds of tantrums about different things. This should shock us because all kids are going to engage in tantrums to a certain extent um, because tantrums are a way of communicating all behavior is a way of communicating and until you are old enough so that you feel like you have some semblance of control and have some way of conveying your needs and getting them met you are going to engage in some behavior that is going to look like a tantrum right and if we think about it think about some adults in your life there are adults who still throw tantrums because they don't have a way of getting their needs met well the good news is if we can help our children and build skills with them, they will start to be able to get their needs met in other ways, right? I know we're singing the same song all day long, but I want everybody to know that we don't have to just get to the place where we say, okay, my child's going to throw tantrums and there's nothing I can do about it. That's not true. There are a lot of things that we can do. So, um, just like so many other, like all the other things we've talked about with behavior, there are some uh, there's, it serves a purpose. A tantrum serves a purpose. And there are some usual suspects. Kids throw tantrums to get attention. They throw tantrums to get out of doing something. Uh, they throw tantrums to get something they want. This includes gaining control over another person or situation or gaining access to a ritual or, ro or routines. We'll see that for kids who do repetitive behaviors like opening and closing a door, and if we take away their ability to do that and put them someplace else and challenge that behavior, they'll throw a tantrum because their hope is that we will be so uncomfortable by their tantrum, and of course they're not thinking this through, right? But it has worked in the past that sometimes we go, oh, I really just don't want to deal with this, and then we let them go back and open and close the door because they seem to be happy. And we're not in the business of just making our children miserable, right? We try not to be. <laughs> Every once in a while I tease my son and say, yes, that's my job. It's my job to make you miserable. And then he always laughs because he knows that that's not my job and that I'm kidding. Um, but sometimes children offer, they, they do tantrums to offer protest or frustration. You can't get your needs met in any other way. Boy, it's really frustrating. Okay, so, uh, and tantrums feel good. Oh. Oh, they feel good, don't they? When was the last time you threw a tantrum? There is something about them that sometimes it just feels good sometimes to just go, ah. I saw one of my friends on Facebook uh, who, man, what an incredible mom of two kids on the spectrum. And yesterday, her Facebook status, she said, scream. And then she went, whew, I feel better now. <laughs> 
You know, we all feel that way sometimes, that sometimes you just want to go, I, I want to ah, not act polite about it, right? Uh, imagine for a child, there is something about it that can feel really good. Unfortunately, though, uh, children will continue to have tantrums and have them over and over and over again if we in any way reward them. And I know you and you know me, we're smart people. We would never reward a tantrum, right? That would be the last thing that we would do intentionally. And yet we do do it unintentionally all the time, all the time. And we're going to forgive ourselves for that. Um, we didn't cause the tantrum, but we can take control over the over how we react to the tantrum and help to diminish them or help to make them go com away completely. Now that's a powerful place to be in, right? Instead of being like, oh no, I did it wrong, right? And beating ourselves with the wet noodle. Uh, we don't have to do that. Uh, but we don't want to be in the position of rewarding tantrums whenever possible. Okay. Uh, and we have to be cognizant of the fact that children with developmental delays are there because of sometimes their ability to communicate is compromised. Um, they're going to throw tantrums. They have the potential anyway to throw tantrums longer and for and to have them last longer. Right. Uh, bad news. But the good news is that if we give them functional communication skills, we can decrease the frequency and the duration of the tantrums and sometimes make them go away altogether. Okay, so we need to talk about tantrums with this ABC contingent. What happened right before the tantrum? What does the tantrum look like? And what is the consequence of the tantrum? So think about the last tantrum that your child threw. What did it look like? And they call this, the, the behavior is called the topography of the behavior. Uh, what did, the, what did the behavior look like? What did it look like exactly? Uh, you know, did the child throw themselves on the ground? Did the child, my son was good at swiping. He would walk over and anything that I had anywhere on a desk, on a table, and he would just fling the whole thing. And then if that didn't get what he wanted, then he would take whatever was flung to the floor and he would do this with it, like a salad spinner, right? Throwing it up into the air. Loved to do that and it drove me bonkers. Uh, and because it, it overwhelmed me, you know. Um, so, but again, we want to keep a three column sheet and say to ourselves, okay, what's the behavior look like? And write it down. Well, you know, the behavior happened at 4.15 and she uh, started yelling and then she started throwing things. Then she bit somebody. Then she broke something. Then she stomped her feet. Then she tried to take pictures off the wall. Write it out. There's something therapeutic about it anyway, uh, that you write out the whole thing, uh, and obviously not while it's happening, right? As, but as soon as you can afterwards, you write it all out. Then the next thing you want to write down is what was the consequence for it? What happened afterwards? Um, did anybody yell at the child and say, that's not appropriate, we don't allow that? right? Uh, did anybody take anything away? Did the child get a time out? Uh, was the child removed from the room? Was the child, you know, did, did somebody pick up the child and, and rock the child? Uh, did the child get cookies and milk afterwards? Did the child get to take a nap? Uh, you know, what happened? Sometimes children will scream and yell and throw a tantrum to the point where eventually they exhaust themselves and they lay down and go to sleep. So what was the consequence? What happened as a result of the behavior? Um, and then you want to go back and say, all right, now I got to be the detective and try to remember what happened right beforehand. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes you go, oh, well, you know, I said that we were done playing with this toy or their friend left with a play date or we had to leave the grocery store, whatever it is. Other times you go, I have no idea. It seemed to come out of left field. Oh, those are the ones we really got to be mindful of because nothing comes directly out of left field. Um, okay, so we take a look at the behavior in all these different ways. Uh, and then we talk about what to do. That's after the tantrum is over. But let's talk for a second about what to do during a tantrum. So there are some things that we can do. And the first most important thing is for ourselves to remain calm. Oh my gosh, that's the hardest thing in the world, isn't it? Uh, because depending on where you are and what kind of day it is, sometimes you want to throw a tantrum with them. 
Uh, or sometimes you just want to cry and say, this is not what I wanted for my life. This is not what I wanted for my child's life. Uh, sometimes we're concerned about what other people are thinking or what other people are doing or what other people are saying or what they're going to think or going to say or going to do, right? It becomes this whole big everything in our life moment weighing on our shoulders. We really don't want to go there. We really want to stay really dispassionate. I always say, think like a court reporter in those moments. So you completely cut off the emotion and you emotional divorce from it and go, what's happening? Look at that. Look at my child freaking out. Look at that lady over there freaking out that my child's freaking out, right? You just like notice it and stay completely calm. It's the hardest thing in the world, but I got to tell you, and people had told me to do this and I was like, yeah, right. Do you know what it feels like when my child is freaking out and doing all this stuff? And then I saw therapists come into my house that were trained to do this, and my child would be freaking out, and they'd be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. completely unimpressed. And I noticed that when they were that way, my child's tantrum was not as long and not as severe. And I went, huh, I think I'll try that because <laughs> I want to be in the category of not as long and not as severe, right? Uh, and I got really interested in perfecting this mask of calm. I see what you're doing and I got no feelings about it. I'm a little on the board side, right? Um, and inside you might be completely losing it, but on the outside you're breathing and going, yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> Harder to do than it is to say, but work towards it. Trust me, it takes some of the oxygen out of the fire of their tantrum. Okay. Whatever you do, you don't want to try to teach the child about the tantrums during a tantrum. While the child's throwing a tantrum, this is, and, and you realize, oh gosh, oh, I know why this is happening, because they haven't had anything to eat in six hours. What was I thinking? I should have fed this child before now, and you realize all that. and instinctively we say, oh, you know what, honey, you're just tired and you're hungry and mommy's going to get you something to eat. Ah, la, 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 right? This is not the moment. Think all those things and, and be thinking about as soon as this tantrum, you know, kind of winds down, I'm going to stick something in that child's mouth, <laughs> but we're not going to teach them about tantrums and, and, you know, well, you know, you're just tantruming because you want access to that thing over there that I say, no, 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 no. The less talking, the better during the tantrum. It's not going to help. Think about when you're ha upset about something and you're really like at the peak of frustration and somebody wants to say, well, you know, you're going to feel better. Oh, shut up. Right. <laughs> That's how we feel. So of course, you know, it's not going to help. Uh, so we keep it to ourselves. Remove potentially hazardous objects or people. <laughs> and I mean that. So if your child, you're in the grocery store and your child is starting to have a tantrum. Oh, I remember one tantrum that my child had at the checkout stand and they had all those little cards saying, would you like to feed uh, homeless people? And he was ripping it off the thing and throwing them. And uh, there were two little old ladies who were in line behind us. And I was trying to get out of that line as fast as I could. And so, and I, you know, you have to turn into an octopus, right? So I was trying to move things out of his range and one of the little old ladies wanted to be helpful and have, had a conversation. And I literally looked at her and I said, could you please help me? And she said, yes. And I said, I need you to stand back and please don't say anything, <laughs> you know? And I think she was a little affronted, but I didn't want her to get hurt. I didn't, you know, if he started lashing out, boy, that was a place that it could have gone to. So at home, my husband and I, if my son would go and we would see the hand come out to swipe and we would move simultaneously. We got really good at grabbing everything off the table and putting it out of reach as fast as we could, not giving the behavior attention, but making sure that we had minimized the amount of damage that he could do to himself or to someone else or to something else, right? Um, and boy, they turn into little hulks, don't they? I can remember my son trying to overturn the therapy table because he was ticked. And my husband just went over and sat on the therapy table and was like inspecting his fingernails and sat there because there was no way my son was overturning the table with my husband sitting on it. It's like, mm, well, just diffuse that. What are you going to do now, pal? And then he went looking for something else and he would, he would look like, what can I do? What can I wreck? What can I be in control of? 
I know from tantrums. <laughs> I've been there, done that. Uh, so you get very good at very, you, know, you don't go, oh my goodness, we have to move everything. No, 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 you just, we would go boom, boom, and move everything out of the way. And you might have to do it 22 times as they're looking around and finding the thing to tantrum. Uh, remember, this is not something that we're going to do every single day because we're going to get to the point where the tantrum doesn't happen anymore. But when it's happening, we got to be good at getting this under control. And then we're going to pla practice planned ignoring in some cases. And again, we go back to the planned ignoring. This is not the same thing as ignoring your child. It's ignoring the specific behavior. So my son is swiping things off the plate. We didn't pay any attention. I didn't say, don't swipe. Don't do that. That's not polite. That nag, 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 right? Of no use. It has no effect except to feed the flames. Uh, we don't let it just happen, right? We block what we can, move what we can. My husband's sitting on the table. It's blocking it. But he didn't have a conversation, didn't look at him. Now, we're not ignoring the child. We're ignoring the behavior. It's a very fine distinction. You stay in the room. You never, ever leave. And I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, okay. So during a tantrum, things not to do. We absolutely don't want to reward the child to get them to stop. Oh. Man. And you know, you see that on the on the screen and you go, well, I would never do that. That's just ridiculous. And yet we do. We do. And sometimes we don't think about it until afterwards and go, oh my goodness, I did. I did that. That thing I said I would never do. Um, so we try really hard not to do that. And I know they have a sixth sense. They can tell the moment in which they could get away with something because you're like, oh no, my boss is here. Just anything but right now. This is the worst possible moment, I swear. You know, I'll pay $100 if you stop kind of thing, right? That they do in the movies. Um, we have to avoid that because the next tantrum will be that much worse if we do that. We do not put the child somewhere by themselves. So planned ignoring does not mean sticking the, you know, I know people do time out and they go, well, you're going to go to your room and I'll shut the door. Bad plan. You need to keep the child where you can see them and hear them for safety issues if for nothing else. Um, but we know that Sometimes they're tantruming to get an escape, and if you're putting them in another room, you just fed it. You just rewarded it, that thing we said we weren't going to do, right? So the child has to stay in the same room with you. You've got to have visual. You have to be able to hear and see them, right? Even though you might be practicing planned ignoring, you need to be in the same room so that you can, if something happens and escalates, you can be there to help. Uh, we're not going to, this is the hard one for me, we're not going to scold, nag, yell, lose our temper, or berate the child for their behavior. Oh, it's so hard. Um, yeah, it is. It's so hard, but we have to, if we want to be effective and if we want for the tantrums to stop and we want for this one to dial down faster as opposed to slower, we, you know, <laughs> not saying anything. Don't give it the attention. It might be attention driven, which means you're once again rewarding it. You're standing there going, I am not putting up with this behavior, blah, blah, blah. but the child's doing it for attention. Guess what? They're going to do it more. We have to keep our mouths closed. So hard for me. I don't know about for you. Okay. Acceptance and control. For every behavior, there's a before and the after. Generally, we can't control somebody's behavior. Usually, we can control either what happens before or the consequence, and a lot of times, we can control both. Okay? So when we look at tantrums and we look, okay, why did this happen? What happened before? What does it actually look like? What is my consequence going to be? We need to do an FBA a functional behavior assessment on the tantrum. If it's for, if the ch child is tantruming for attention, if we discover, okay, well, attention is the function of this behavior, then we are going to stop giving attention. We're going to put that on, that behavior on extinction. So when that child, um, and when we put something on extinction, it means we cut off the reward to it. So if in the past the child has tantrumed um, and we talked to them and said, hey, there's no more tantruming, we don't do that, da 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 da, -da. now we're going to do planned ignoring ex instead and we're going to start to give this child attention on a regular basis. And we looked at it and said, okay, we have... Um, 
whenever we get together for this one play date and mom is talking to this one person, this child tantrums. And it's because they want mom's attention. So for the next five or six play dates that we go to, instead of standing and talking with the other mom, every single, like every 30 seconds or every minute, mom is going to go over and give attention to the child saying, you're doing such a good job playing with your friend and not go sit and talk with the other moms. Uh, while at the same time, we're going to teach the child appropriate ways to get mom's attention, to ask for attention, to, to come over and make the sign or, to, you know, um, make the gesture or point to the picture to say, mom, I want you to play with me and not play with the other mom. Um, all different kinds of circumstances in which attention can be, but we want to give attention on a regular basis. So we, you know, that's an antecedent modification. So before we get to the place where the child feels like nobody's paying attention to me, there's always this attention. We can fade it over time. Um, but we're also teaching how to get attention appropriately. And whatever happens, if the tantrum happens, if we didn't give enough attention and the tantrum happens, we do not give that attention. Paying attention to the child, but not the behavior. Okay. Um, imagine that the tantrum is happening because the child wants to escape something. We talked about this earlier. We do not allow them to escape the behavior. We teach them appropriate ways to ask for a break and we try to make whatever the thing is that they're trying to escape much more reinforcing. Um, if they're engaging in a tantrum to get access to something because they know they want that lollipop and when they threw the tantrum, the old lady one aisle over gave them the lollipop and we want to the old lady in the next aisle over, right? Um, but we need to not give access to the thing, uh, you know, while the tantrum is happening. We need to ask to, to learn skills how to appropriately ask for something. So it may mean that you're giving out lollipops in the checkout stand for a little while because they asked appropriately for the lollipop. And then over time, so we'll, you know, say this today you're going to get it, today you're not going to get it, and we'll work up a whole thing and promise them, say, you know, today when we go into the grocery store, before you ever go in the grocery store, you say, after you've done this for a while and they've gotten the lollipop for asking appropriately, you're going to say, today we're going in before we go in and you're not going to get the lollipop and you're not going to throw a tantrum and for being such a big boy or girl and not throwing the tantrum, later on you're going to get this, right? Um, and we build those skills slowly. The toughest is when it is self-reinforcing. And I'll tell you with a tantrum that it's very rare that it's just reinforcing in and of itself. I think there's almost always another component to it. But if it is just self-reinforcing, all the more reason why you're going to need to have a BCBA in there to look at it and go, okay, here's how we're going to get at this. Because that's a child who doesn't have any other skills um, and needs ways of making themselves feel better. And it can be worked on. It can be fixed. Uh, okay. And of course, we're talking about the FBA. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about meltdowns. When it escalates from a tantrum to a meltdown, and for me, what, what constitutes the difference and what we can do about meltdowns, because there's some really important stuff we need to know about meltdowns and consider. Stick with us back in a minute. Hi, I'm here today with Cecilia Knight, who is the Director of Training for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And she's going to talk to us about something that I'm not entirely clear on, tacting. Tacting is when you make a comment um, on the environment. And then another person may reinforce that with non-specific reinforcement. Can you explain to me what the difference between a tacting program is and an expressive labeling program? In an expressive labeling program, typically the therapist holds up a card, maybe with a turkey on it. Mm -hmm. And the therapist would say, what is this? It referencing the picture. Mm -hmm. And the child would respond, turkey. The child is labeling the item. Mm -hmm. With a tact, it's a comment on the environment. So it can be evoked by a smell. So if I walk into the house and I smell Thanksgiving dinner, I can say, mmm, turkey. Or if I hear gobble, 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 I can say, that's a turkey. So it's a comment on the environment, which is different than just naming the item.
how do you get a child to comment on the environment? That's got to be hard. It is. Um, we use different prompts. Um, most of the time we use vocal prompts. Um, for example, we may look through a book and point to the picture of an item and say, oh look, it's Nemo. Say, Nemo, and then reinforce the child for responding. Um, or we may say, what do you see? Say, Nemo. And then eventually we would want to fade our point away. So I may say, look, Nemo. And then the child is referencing that and then also saying, that's right, I see Nemo. Um, and then later fading completely away so the picture of Nemo itself evokes the comment. If we're working on something auditory, maybe we have a cow on the table and we play the environmental sound in front of them, maybe give them a vocal prompt to say, it's a cow, and the child may say, it's a cow. And then we might fade the visual of the cow and they just hear the sound. And we prompt them by saying, say, it's a cow, or I hear a cow, and then eventually fade until the sound itself evokes the comment. The goal is to get towards spontaneous tacting, where the child can walk around and comment on the novel things in the environment that he hears or sees. And so that's a great way to sort of bridge to that point. Tacting is really important to get to higher level um, lessons of interverbal behavior. Um, commenting on things that are private events or commenting on things that I can't um, see that you're feeling, like your stomach hurts. But it's important to have those tacks in place so you can get to those later programs. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're having challenging, challenging behavior marathon today. And so, of course, I've saved the best for last, right? Uh, note the sarcasm, meltdowns. Um, and for me, um, and maybe you have a different definition of meltdown than I do, but, you know, uh, frequently a meltdown starts with a tantrum, but it crosses over at some point into a thing where usually with a tantrum, we can we can see kind of what started it um, and that there was something in particular that, and sometimes we can't know in the moment, but we'll realize later, okay, there was something that the child wanted. Um, for instance, there on the A word, if you have an opportunity to go back and look, there is an episode when we get to see Jack Riley having a tantrum um, and they're asking him to do something, comply with something that he's complied with hundreds of times. They're asking him to sit down, that he has to stand up and then they tell him to sit down and he's done it before. <laughs> In fact, I think he's even, <laughs> excuse me, mastered this skill. But on this particular occasion, he is trying to get up off the chair and the parents are sitting there and the therapist is there and the therapist is staying very calm and putting him back on the chair and he's struggling and he's crying and he's being very aggressive and he's trying to get off the chair and she's trying to get him to you know stand up and then sit back down and he doesn't want to and nobody can quite figure out and he doesn't have the skills yet to say what it is that he wants to do he's not really being given a choice about it it's they're in the middle of a lesson and she can't back down now right um, and he's not being hurt but he's clearly frustrated he doesn't have the functional communication skills to say what's going on right it's so clear and you know as a parent you watch it and you go oh I understand why these parents are frustrated and I understand why he's frustrated but you know we got to start somewhere and get somewhere right um, and finally he calms down enough that they tell him that if he does this you know he's gonna get his bubbles and he doesn't even seem to be interested in the bubbles which is a very reinforcing thing for him at this point in therapy so it's like gee what's going on here and then eventually he gets worn down enough that he just does it he's like oh okay you just want me to stand up and sit down and then I get to go do, go do what I want to do and they think that it's the bubbles that he's going to be reinforced by the bubbles um, and the mom's blowing the bubbles and he walks right away from her and he gets under the dining room table because he needed to take a poop he needed to take a poop and that's where you know how kids are when they're uh, when they've started to realize and they want some privacy and they find a place in the house well his place is under the dining room table and he goes there to squat down and take a poop and the minute he does it everybody goes oh he needed to take a poop and he doesn't have the skills to say I need 
some privacy. I need to go to the bathroom. I need to take a poop, whatever it is that they're going to teach him to do. Um, but so he's been having this tantrum um, because, and there's always something that the child wants uh, and they're not being able to convey it with, with the tantrum, right? Um, but at some point, sometimes it crosses over into a meltdown. And for me, the distinction between the two is that when it's the meltdown, you could, you wouldn't, but you could even offer them the thing that they wanted that started the tantrum to begin with and they still wouldn't take it and it still wouldn't make it better. It crosses over into this place where they're virtually inconsolable. They're not in control of themselves anymore. It's We've lost track of what they wanted to begin with and they are just unhappy, crying, potentially hysterical, not sometimes even aware, you know, they get glossed over and they're just a hurting unit, right? Well, it's so important when a child is getting to meltdown stage to not only look at what started the tantrum, right? We want to do that because we want to be able to help with the functional communication skills to head that tantrum off at the past. But when it gets to meltdown stage, we also need to look for environmental clues. And what I mean by that is this is, we talked earlier about establishing operations. What are the other establishing operations that could be getting us to meltdown stage? And what else is going on in the environment that could be creating a problem? For instance, you know, the child who uh, hasn't had something to eat for eight hours, I know we're all trying hard not to make that happen, but sometimes it just does. You're stuck on a plane or you're somewhere and that's what happens, right? And you just weren't as prepared as you wish you could have been, but, you know, it happens. And so what would have just been a typical tantrum then turns into a meltdown because the child's already got all these other things going on in their little bodies. Um, so that's an establishing operation that's on board that's m making us much more likely to be successful at having a full-blown tantrum, right? Um, also, you know, sometimes it can be something that the child has just eaten and they're having an allergic reaction to it, that it, maybe it's a mild allergic reaction, so you're not seeing hives or something like that, but it is making their temperature rise and creating a circumstance in which they have less control over themselves. I personally am allergic to wheat, and let me just tell you, if I get wheat by accident, it is the ugliest thing in the world. And I literally feel it, my temperature starts to rise. Sometimes I'll start to get hives, but usually not. I don't even know what's happening in the moment, but I, it's like, you know, they have the phrase, you're raising your hackles. And that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like there's little spikes underneath my skin and I am uncomfortable and angry inconsolably angry. I can't even tell you what about, but I am an unhappy person. And over the years, I've gotten really good at avoiding wheat. And so, you know, it doesn't usually happen, but every once in a while I'll go, something is not right. I must have gotten some wheat because I just, and I know to take a Benadryl and go to bed because I am not fit for human consumption. Who? And I can't imagine in a child what that must feel like. Um, but, ooh, it's not pleasant, right? So, and sometimes it can be something like that. For some of our kids who have sensory issues, it can be a tag in a shirt or it can be water on a sleeve that just, oh my gosh, it just makes everything so much worse everything so much worse. Um, so we got to look at what the environmental clues are. For some of our kids, it's an additive in some food. For some of you, you've got kids that have an allergic reaction to um, food dyes or just an ingredient in something. Um, I, um, one of my sister's kids, that she could go to every fast food restaurant and get french fries, but there was one in particular that she would give her daughter those french fries and, oh, watch the fireworks, right? But not from a pleasant seat. And, and over time, she figured it out and went, man, I just can't get french fries in there. I don't know what they put in it, but my kid goes into full-on meltdown, like they'd have to stick her in the bathtub to get her to come calm down. Um, so, you know, really be looking at those kinds of things because if you've seen a child have an allergic reaction to something, it's meltdown. It's meltdown. Um, 
So it could be those things, and that's a great thing to go and look at with your pediatrician, but it could be any one of them, so many things. So look around for the environmental clues. Um, I've seen it happen in a room where um, they have fluorescent lighting that the timer was just off, so maybe everybody else wouldn't notice, but there's just a little bit of a flicker, and for some kids, that's Meltdown City. For some adults, that's Meltdown City. I don't deal well being in a room full of ceiling fans that the fans are below the lights, I'll get dizzy uh, after a while. It's it's a little bit like a strobe light. Um, so it can be so many different things, um, but really important to be doing your three column and looking at all the antecedents about uh, what's happening. I've shared before my son throwing a tantrum at the same place in the same grocery store every single time we would go to the grocery store and I couldn't figure out why. And and eventually somebody came and looked and said, look, the floor changes here. It goes from this very specific, uh, very rough tiled floor to this very slick glazed floor. And my son couldn't handle it and he didn't have the means of telling me that. I don't think he even knew and I sure didn't notice it, but we were able to work on it. My child goes to that grocery store three times a week now and we never have any problem as a result of it. And it spread out to other things too that we could go other places and I noticed, oh my gosh, you know, we don't have a tantrum here either. And look, there is a floor change here. Um, try to head meltdowns off at the pass um, so that if we know, once we start to know, okay, well, you know, we can't get French fries from this place. Or, you know, we, we know it's gotten hot and the child's got too many clothes on that we're paying attention to those kinds of things because if they get overheated and they have meltdowns, then we want to make sure that, that we dress them in layers so that we can take it off. Uh, that If we know that the child, if they go really long without having something to eat, and that's almost all of them, right? That we got to make sure that we pack snacks so that if we're stuck someplace that we can stick something in their mouth that's going to help them to keep keep it together, that we keep them hydrated, um, that we are mindful of the kinds of things that set them off and try to get there before they happen. We can't always, um, but as much as possible, we want to be mindful of it. Uh, that strategies for antecedent modification that, you know, that when we see that we're starting, the tantrum is starting and we know that some of those other things, you know, and you're going through your head and going, oh, okay, here comes the tantrum and, oh, and, and he hasn't been fed and we're in the place where he does that, right? That we can, you know, stop it right there and say, okay, we're not, we're not going into this place because we don't have enough things on board for us to deal with what might happen. So we're not going into that store today. We're just not going to do it. Um, you know, and looking at what we can change in the before. Um, and then building in stop points, places where we go, okay, that's it. It's not worth it today. We're, we're leaving the store. Um, or, you know, I, I think about with my sister, with my niece, they literally, you know, when it would get to such a point that she was inconsolable, they would run a bath and they would stick her fully clothed in the, in the bath, take off her shoes and stick her in the bath. And th she would be extra hysterical for a minute and then she would start to calm down because it just like, you know, I wouldn't recommend that for everybody. And I'm talking about putting an inch of water in the bathtub and staying right there, not walking away. Um, and that isn't for everybody but there are other kids that, very small kids that have a meltdown, if they're really reinforced with water, sticking a little uh, dish of water and letting them stick their hands in it for whatever reason sometimes, for some kids, that can be like a stop point of a just, you know, we calm down, putting a, a cold washcloth, not freezing cold, but a cool washcloth on a head to, you know, kind of get a grip, um, right? We, we have to have some stop things that... Um, that can help us so that it doesn't keep escalating, 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 right? Know that when your child is having a meltdown, it is because they are wildly uncomfortable. Uh, they are, they are, it is not pleasant for them either. I think, you know, if anything, you, you want to stay as emotionally divorced as possible, but if you're going to feel anything in a meltdown, just think to yourself, okay, something is really not happy with my child, and I want to be really aware of the fact that something's going on, I'm going to deal with it here, and then we're going to go back and find the clues, look for the clues, so that we can start to make this something that doesn't come up again.
right? So unpleasant for everyone. But meltdowns can be dealt with. They really can. Um, but I, it goes back to the same things that we were saying about with tantrums, um, that we want to make sure that we're staying calm. Now, the, the overall with, with challenging behavior, with tantrums, meltdowns, and everything else, and I said this before, it is as though children have a sixth sense that they know the worst possible moment that they can engage in this behavior and that's when it happens, right? It's like they can tell when we can handle it and when we can't handle it. And so know that that's a part of it. Know that on the day when you really are not going to be able to deal with the tantrum or meltdown, that's the day that your child is most likely going to engage in it. So think that through. And, you know, really apply your executive function skills to that. Say to yourself, all right, so I know I'm going to be distracted, which means I'm going to be setting up a circumstance where they're more likely to engage in this behavior. So what can I do to not do that? I'm going to have all my stuff together for what I, I need to go to. Uh, so if you're you know, trying to get out the door to go someplace and it's always that thing of why when we are in a hurry are we doing this, right? But we're not gonna say that. So if we know that that's what happens, let's get ahead of it. So we think to ourselves the night before, I know when we're getting ready to leave, that's when my child's gonna engage in this. So what can I do? What's within my control? Oh, I can pack all of my stuff and my stuff can all be in the car. So I'm not going to be getting my stuff together and I can pack all of their stuff and it can be in the car, which means that when it's time to go, I'm going to be able to give them my undivided attention and all of my nervousness and my anxiety is taken care of because the, the car is packed and I'm good to go and I know I'm not forgetting anything and I've gassed the car and I've done all this stuff. So I'm going to be able to put all of my stuff in the back seat so I can deal with their anxiety and I can deal with their need for attention and I can deal with their need to understand what's going on and be in control of it. Um, it's a lot of work, but ultimately it's so much more pleasant than trying to get everything out the door and dealing with a child who's tantruming while you're worrying about it escalating into a meltdown, right? So it is a certain amount of preparation personally. Um, and when we're working on tantrums and meltdowns in particular, we want to make sure that we, we have taken care of our stuff. I've I've said before on the show that um, because my son would have tantrums in the grocery store, which is very common and not just our kids on the spectrum, um, and there is a little bit of a thing where I strongly suspect that they know that we're not going to just walk out of the store because we need the groceries, right? And what I had to get to was the place where I had done all my grocery shopping and we went to the store to work on the tantrum. So he started with the tantrum and we walked out. Oh my gosh, if you could have seen the look on my child's face, he was like, what's happening? Normally I get to do the tantrum because you're still paying for stuff. And I was like, mm, not happening today. I only had to do that a couple of times and then that was over. So worth it, worth it to get it under control. Uh, we've talked a lot about challenging behavior today and we'll talk some more about it tomorrow. We're going to have Evelyn Gould, a BCBA with us tomorrow, and we'll talk about some challenging behavior. And then tomorrow at 11, we're going to be joined by the fabulous Nancy Allspot Jackson, Executive Director of ACT Today. She's going to be with us and we're going to show you some of the wonderful interviews that we did while we were at the Walk for Autism, the Los Angeles Walk Now for Autism that was on Saturday. So a really wonderful. Don't miss that. That's at 11 o'clock tomorrow with Nancy. Hey, as this show ends, the conversation continues. I'm going to ask Emily to cycle through some of the different ways that you can get a hold of us, some of the different ways that you can be watching the show. Again, I want you guys to know, I know it was a little bit tough today because we had some technical difficulties at the beginning, so it was harder to get a hold of us, but there's so many ways to get a hold of us. And you guys overwhelmingly did on Facebook. I thank you for that. Always be a part of the conversation. Together, we have so many more solutions than if we all stay separately thinking about how hard things are. Uh, we had the mom write in today and say, I'd really like to go to Disneyland, but there's no way that my child can stand online that long. And you guys overwhelming wrote, wrote in and said, you don't have to do it that way. There's a special alleged pass. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we can do for each other. Use this forum. Use my connections that I've been given on your behalf. Let us know the kinds of things you're interested in. 
think about the things that we talked about with challenging behavior today. And if you are trying something, let us know how it's working out. Let us know if you're seeing progress. Let us know if there's one element of it that you're not understanding so you're not able to implement it in the way that you want to. Talk to us. That's what we want more than anything else is for you to talk to us. So again, want to remind you tomorrow at 10 o'clock, Evelyn Gould, BCBA, and 11 o'clock, Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, a special edition where we're going to show you some of the amazing interviews that we did. We'll be back at 9 o'clock tomorrow talking about challenging behavior. Until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.